Uh, I am recording. Me too. Cool. <laughs> Josiah, this is like the rawest Let's we've ever started in. the pod. Like, <laughs> <laughs> leave all of that in. <laughs> you sounded so grumpy. You're like, I cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. Cool. Cool. You, you know, I got to say. Um, it is I, cool. Think about it. It's cool. I can record into my computer and it sounds not bad. That is cool, Sam. Don't take it for granted. I don't. You know, I, I think I take I take a lot of things for granted, a lot of my privilege for granted. But being able to record <laughs> a, a podcast into my computer is absolutely one of those things. So uh, yeah, no, we'll, we'll definitely leave in uh, leave in that that realness <laughs> off the top. <laughs> oh man. Okay, here's some more. There we go. Cracking the Red Bull. Just uh, we should get a Red Bull. You're, you're having actually. quite a. You're having quite a quite a week, it seems. It's been a whirlwind time, man. So, uh, very last minute, I ended up in uh, Atlanta, uh, home of the Josiah Drip, for like two days, <laughs> and then I was in LA for. Did a day. anyone tell you that you were dripping while I, you were walking around? I, I like in my head, I was like, I wonder if, but no, I assure you, no one, no one <laughs> even like thought it. But but actually, something very interesting did happen to me in Atlanta. Um, Someone asked me if I uh, if I used to play football, which like <laughs> we've talked a lot about what my height. Mean? I don't know. It was just like one of those things where they were like, I was just like talking to someone. They're like, so like, did you play football? And I was like, what? Like, so sort of apropos of nothing. I think earlier maybe we had been talking about kind of like sports and stuff, and they maybe assumed that that was um, that was mine. And, and and you know, everyone is is very aware. That I'm like four foot one or whatever is canon now on the pod. <laughs> right. But we've never really talked about my body type, like what what that four one kind of looks like. <laughs> and and I feel comfortable saying this: not a football player's body. So uh, so that's a no, weird you one have that a, I've been puzzling would, over for a while, to be honest. You you have a like any time I've ever met someone who's been on TV before, they look like you in real life. Like you just look like a TV <laughs> guy. Right. I'm just just like, like uh, you're not tall, but you just like proportionally makes sense as a man, but you're just not tall. It's very, you're just a TV guy. That's all it is. Right. And I dress and, and why I've never been told that I, that I'm dripping is, is uh, I think we've discussed this on the pod, but you know, a uh, former guest friend of the pod, Auntie Donahue uh, consistently tells me that I dress like a sim. And so definitely no one in Atlanta <laughs> is impressed uh, by my sim style dress code. And then I was in LA for like 24 hours and I flew in on a red eye this morning, had a, a, a full Did you puke on yourself? Did you have I puked all, on yourself all over at all? myself. <laughs> uh, that's how you know it was an official Blink-155 flight. And I puked all over <laughs> myself, got home, uh, got home, and of course we're in a time crunch uh, because uh, you and I both are extremely excited to watch night one of the Democratic uh, presidential uh, nomination <laughs> yeah. debates tonight. So see that's what, what we're ba- rip through what this Beto's episode. Up to. Yeah, I mean, what we, kind of what kind of punk bands is Beto going to name drop <laughs> this time? <laughs> we should get uh, Cedric and Beto on the pods. So for people who miss this, <laughs> Cedric from uh, At the Drive-In and Mars Volta and X whatever shit band Beto was in with him um, is really defending uh, Beto on Twitter. I think Twitter. they were called Screwdriver. I think that both of them were in the band <laughs> Screwdriver, starting on LP2, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> right, that's canon. Uh, did you, <laughs> was it you mixing it up with Cedric about, about punk and Beto, or was that, was that, um, yeah, I was, and then I was also mixing, I was also mixing it up with, uh, I forget his name now, but like a former Breitbart writer was talking to the pod, because he was saying, and actually, the, we bring this up later in one of the three guest spots on this episode. <laughs> this is a rich <laughs> episode, like, like a truly bountiful, bountiful gift for everyone. But like everyone is trying to claim punk, like conservatives and uh, dork ass centrists um, are trying to claim punk right now. I don't really understand why. It's like <laughs> sort of such a like antiquated thing to sort of use as a bragging chip. Yeah, like uh, please do, like fight. have it. You can have it. I feel like Beto and the <laughs> yeah. racists can have punk, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's like who's like going to be voting in the election? Being like, who's the most punk? This metric that exists from like ended in maybe two thousand two or something. <laughs> wow, that is you know? generous. <laughs> yeah, like I'm thinking, like once the Sour Patch Kids recording studio existed, that was when they was finally like, okay, we can probably just like stop talking about selling out now. Sour Patch Kids has done some great work for uh, independent music, Josiah. So. <laughs> Show, show some respect. Do you think even Ian Mackay is going to vote for Beto? 
<laughs> I don't know. Like, do you think Ian MacKay still thinks about punk stuff and thinks about, like, what punk means? I think he's forced to every time he appears in a documentary about the history of punk, which is, like, you know, once every two to three days. Is is he in any of your... I, I know you can't really talk about your projects, but have you gotten Ian MacKay on the horn for anything yet? No, I have, I, I've never uh, I, I've never spoken to Ian MacKay. Have I talked about Ian MacKay calling my house when I like live with my parents still, though? I think so, yeah. And yeah. I think we all have a story like that with Ian MacKay. <laughs> Ian MacKay has um, called everyone's really just... parents' house. <laughs> <laughs> he's never rejected a single interview except for Blink-155. And me, like, I was trying to interview him about a feature on Straight Edge for Exclaimed, so he's rejected me. It's, it's oh, only me. okay, okay. So it has nothing to do with you, even though the Blink-155 request, I guess, came through came through you. But but just uh, one more piece on, on my sort of travel, my travel journey, which was uh, last night I was uh, at the airport in, in Los Angeles and they were paging uh, a Hughes for the flight to San Diego. And I thought, man, maybe, maybe <laughs> you're on your way to surprise Bill or something. It was like a real stretch, but I did have to message you about it. I was like, I feel like the pod is everywhere. <laughs> you did. I appreciated that. Yeah. Um, I love when you go on these business trips and I'm sending you like, uh, <laughs> Mark Hoppus did a tweet and the timestamp said one. And you're like, that's cool. I'm like literally like having brunch with uh, (laughs) David Geffen right now or whatever. (laughs) Yeah, that's that is um, that's definitely the kind of meetings that I have for sure is uh, a a lot. When do we like when do when do you when do we when do you achieve enough success that we can like talk about all the hilarious things that you're doing all the time? I guess like at once they're level? all more, re- yeah. At what level does it become? I think it just everything needs to be more real. It's like it's all still like everything's uh, everything's bubbling, you know. But then it so maybe be- like in a in a year or something we can do exclusively about like what all these celebs breath smells like. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. It'll be the does my breath smell celeb edition exclusive. <laughs> it's gonna be uh, truly, truly invigorating and exciting shit. Yeah, I think that's what people so want to know. You, you've never played football. I've never, I've, uh, I mean, uh, you know, like, look at, I've tossed around the pigskin with the boys and the, and the girls, <laughs> of uh, course. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I already regret this question. <laughs> no, but I don't think, I, I don't think that I have a football uh, body type, but of course I look forward to hearing about this, uh, later on from the nation. Um, <laughs> although I gotta say, I was a little disappointed, like, uh, last week, uh, you know, uh, I spoke, uh, unfortunately, quite little about Rocky Horror, but I threw out that I'd be happy to uh, engage with anyone who wanted to discuss it with me. And I think I literally had like zero people take me up on let's (laughs) let's talk about Rocky Horror on Friday. So Uh, that's okay. You know what? I forgot to show you something. That's actually not true. Did someone Um, DM you? Somebody (laughs) does want to talk to us about Rocky Horror Picture Show. They're using that. Is it Tim Curry? Is it Tim Curry? Tim Curry's going to come on the pod? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Did he die or something recently? No. No, I don't think so. I get so. him confused with, is it Tim Roth? Is the other Tim? I don't think Tim Roth died. And those are two very no, different I know. Tims. And then I saw somebody talking to you about, what's the other one? F- a Phantom of the Planet or Phantom whatever? Phantom of the Paradise, yeah. Fa- come on, man. <laughs> That's true. People, well, the funny yeah, thing I, about that, I've never seen Phantom of the Paradise, but then dude, you should I saw that. this thing that uh, there's a documentary about it now because apparently it was a huge flop everywhere except for in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is where I was born. And, like, there's this whole community of people that are obsessed with it who watched it endlessly. Um, and and so I mentioned that to my dad because my parents are from Winnipeg and I was born there, but I don't really, I don't really claim Winnipeg because I moved away when I was very little. Um, but anyways, my dad was like, yeah, that was the first movie I ever saw in the theater. So people fucking love that's uh, Phantom wild. of the Planet over there. Yeah. <laughs> you would like Phantom why. of the Planet. You would look at, for like a musical, I feel like you would really love Phantom of the Paradise. And I believe it is on, uh, oh, maybe it's on Shudder. And you got Shudder, so uh, while we're promoting things, Red Bull and AMC <laughs> yeah, Horror Streaming Service. Beto O'Rourke, uh, <laughs> Breitbart. <laughs> All <laughs> here. So... <laughs> Check it out. I just sent you a screenshot of a. I didn't even accept this DM because I'm not doing it. Uh, but this is a. This oh, is like no. in the uh, the other DM folder. 
<laughs> so last week there was this uh, redditor named Blinkman69 who we ruthlessly roasted for their bad takes and everything, um, and they've invited themselves on the pod, mm-hmm. and they've <laughs> they've tagged it by saying that they're a huge Rocky Horror fan. So that's really Sam's people, I think, is uh, Blinkman69. <laughs> I God damn it! I ah. Uh. Okay, cool. So Blinkman69, get at me. We can have our own. Josiah doesn't want to. <laughs> you can start your own pod about uh, jerking off to Jane Curtin or whatever. i got to say, I um, mean, Blinkman69 really strikes me as a bit of. <laughs> uh-huh. Go on. A degenerate. I wanted to make sure, like, you didn't have some sort of, like, DB no, type thought, thing, because I know you were at the yeah. DB show, and so I thought, I like, was. you know, I was like, uh, uh, you know, probably degen- degenerate's a pretty easy word to work in, but that there was a high probability that you'd be like, so, <laughs> I was at the DB show, uh, you know, I met Chris Charge, <laughs> who made the sick crossover shirts, and we, you can buy those on the Instagram, you can DM me, because... <laughs> is that still yeah, working my, out for you, man? Selling all the Blink that is, stuff you know what? Email? I mean, the the tapes. I don't. The tapes aren't done yet, but I'm pretty sure we've basically sold out of them did, via my uh, secretive methods. Did we talk about on and the then, pod the fact that though the tapes had to go back, like had to be remastered, or did that only happen online? <laughs> I can't remember. I don't remember anything okay. at all. So just a very quick <laughs> overview: the tapes have to be remastered because at some point someone screams "castrate Bill Gates" so loud that it clips, and so there was an error at the at the at the pressing yes. facility, the tape pressing facility. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, and also the incredibly hilarious and embarrassing uh, fold-out booklet, which everyone's going to die when they see. Uh, I had to fix the bleed on that <laughs> okay. as well. So okay, so a few errors, just, uh, <laughs> a few little things that have been fixed. Okay, um, but uh, yeah, actually. So I made the – for the shirts, the cutoff is uh, June 30th. So you still got a couple days to hit that Gmail if you want to order one of our <laughs> hot shirts. Smash that motherfucking send button in your email. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but no, I don't know. I don't want to – I mean I want to leave room for you to do the intro sometimes. And also I forgot to think of a pun with this one. And yeah, you're right. It's like – it's D-beat. It's a generator show. I mean it's all that stuff because punk is truly back. And not only mm-hmm. are we talking about the politicians who love punk, but there's that Blink-182 video now that we're going to have to talk about one day where like – they clearly just Google image searched the word punk and then printed out all the flyers. I mean, it looks and so they're, they're much so like the tiny. old This Exists background, which I recognize looks so much like every YouTube background. But it's a reminder that, like, damn, uh, <laughs> I was cool. <laughs> I don't think that that's what it's a reminder of. I love that the Blink video is, like, the the images are so tiny that it's clear they couldn't get, like, full res. <laughs> And then also there's, like, every possible genre and era of punk represented. Like, if you look around, you'll see Gigi Allen and you'll see Fugazi um, and you'll see prenup and junior battles. Of course. I think on our Instagram. That was, uh, I, that was very exciting to, to sort of uh, have Mark kind of nod back after all of the attention yeah, that we've lavished on exactly. him. Exactly. The nods go both. It's a mutual respect. We're nodding. Um, I mean, he tweeted about the pod today. Let's let's let's. It's be a mutual real. respect pro pro Provided he doesn't listen to a full episode, the mutual respect will continue. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> I hope one day he gets bored and something he remembers that the pod exists and is like, I should check that out. And it's like us just being like, try hard piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who can say who's right or wrong? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's fair. So the song Degenerate by the band Blink-182, Josiah, what do you think about this song? Is there a Green Day song where they sing "Degenerate" instead? Doesn't that sound familiar? I don't know. Here, I'll, I'll, I mean, it's been bugging me all day. You never thought to look up just "Degenerate." Green Day I did search that and it didn't work. Maybe I'm mishearing. I feel like it's the song "Hitching a Ride," but I'm looking at the lyrics and I don't see him saying "Degenerate." And I was just thinking, like, I thought those were the lyrics, and I was like, "Why is Billy Joe Armstrong pronouncing "degenerate" wrong? Or have I been pronouncing it all along? Because I'm so that is what I'm most insecure about now is how I pronounce words. But I feel like degenerate is like a, is a, is a safe word. <laughs> also my safe word. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> well, here's what, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I think I'm just hearing something that, maybe? Uh, is that, is that the word? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, Man, Hitcher Ride many... fucking rocks. <laughs> Nimrod is so good. And, uh, someone from the nation did a few weeks ago, 
end up playing a show with Billy Joe Armstrong and had quite a few interesting tweets about it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know how you're going to find it. There's too much shit going on. Where are we? What am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing with my day right now? Uh, Degenerate by Blink-182. Here's my thought. <laughs> I always, this is what happens I when always, we don't talk for 10 minutes beforehand about just like, <laughs> you know, yeah, we're all, how big little lies is this week or whatever. I do want to talk to you about the Nicholas winning reference show, but we don't have time. I've um, only watched one episode, to be honest, so far, but we uh, we can say that. We'll do exclusive. Well, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, let's do exclusive <laughs> about it. I used to always skip this song. And I used to think I hated it, um, and listening it to it today, I think I might love it, actually. I, I had, I would say, a borderline similar reaction. My memory of the song was that, like, this is the closest to a bad song on Dude Ranch. It is definitely the most skippable. And then... Listening to it, I was like, there's, like, fun stuff happening in this song. Like, the pre-chorus where the guitar comes in, sort of just, like, uh, like doing the kind of, like, picking riff. Uh, and and yeah. Scott's doing the ding-ding-ding-ding. Like, the, the fun, like, almost Travis-style kind of, um, like, show borderline showy kind of uh, slow drums is, like, actually a really sick part. But overall, I, agree. Like, I still they, think it's, like, the worst song on the album. But that's fine. This is, like, the greatest album of all time. So, like, you know, there's got to be winners yeah. and losers. I, I think that I've learned that Boring is the more skippable song, but it's still really good because it's weird and atonal and, like, kind of a bizarre post-punk song. But mm-hmm. but this one, Degenerate, um, yeah, it's, like, I don't know. Even looking – well, here's the first thing I want to say before I forget. Just listening to it right now, I noticed that – at the end of the Dude Ranch recording, first of all, it's really... F- I don't think I've ever made it to the end of the song because I've skipped it so many times. <laughs> first of all, it's really funny how he, like, sings high, but then I'm pretty sure he plays the Enter Sandman riff at the end. What? Listen. <laughs> Did you hear that? No, but do, I always do, thought do, of that do, as, do. As, as, like, him sort of the do 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 I always thought of that as like uh, the the prelude to Lemmings, which is the very next song, right? I know. Okay, listen one more okay. time. Okay. Oh, to me you're it's right. Boo, doo, 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 doo. Yeah, I think it's in there. Maybe it's like a mashup. Maybe they're just being kind of like uh, ch- cheeky cheeky riffers. Yeah. Well, like if you if you know what, like when you're. When you're, especially when you're first in a band and you know, like, one, it's like the Mac DeMarco thing, how they used to, like, jam out ACDC songs or whatever between their songs. I think they still might do that, actually, which is quite depressing. <laughs> but, you know, they, that was, like, so fun. Um, I used to do that. I, I would just play, like, the Creed higher riff sometimes, just to mostly to, like, upset my bandmates, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I, I as as a person that plays in a band where like constantly we just entertain ourselves by playing, you know, like fucking lit or bare naked ladies or whatever. I think it's important to enjoy yourself, and if that's you know Metallica or that's you know, um, or that's ACDC, like you know, more power to you, Mac DeMarco or Tom DeLonge. Had Lars known about this, though, oh man, what would he have done? <laughs> Do you think, like, Metallica and Blink have ever hung out? Because has there been a festival where they've just, like, shot the shit? And oh. do they get along because they're just all kind of, like, rich rockers? Or are they, well, like, fundamentally no. there's different got to, people? There's no question that Tom, De- or I mean, that Travis Barker has, like, been in some sort of Grammys mashup band with <laughs> Robert Trujillo, at least. Right, yeah, yeah that's true, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Metallica did a cover of the Stone Roses a couple weeks ago, and it was just like, I don't know. I mean, I don't really like the Stone Roses to begin with, but it was not good. Do you like Metallica? Mm, no. I'm mostly just like some kind of monster. <laughs> Dude, I don't like Metallica very film. much, though. <laughs> some, some I'm kind warming of monster. up to them as I get older. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Some Kind of Monster is one of the greatest films ever made. It's it's It, like, defies logic that they ultimately allowed that thing to be released, and I respect them so much for it. Exactly. Like, seeing that, I'm just like, okay, I could never stay mad at you, Metallica. <laughs> well, oh, and the, obviously the main Metallica crossover is that in Travis's book, he talks about how Tom DeLonge wanted to hire Tony Robbins to help them deal with their inter-band uh, fighting. <laughs> 
Imagine how Which is sick it would be. Completely a nod. Yeah. And, and, and but if like and if they had documented that process, like if there was a some kind of monster type window into like the highly because of course some kind of monster documents this like moment of intense dysfunction in a long running band, and if like around the neighborhoods era, someone must have been filming. Like there must be a like well, like you know burden of dreams lost in La Mancha type document of that fucked up period in Blake's career, right? Like there ha- there's no fucking way that the label or management or someone didn't have videographers there constantly. Whatever promo material they produced certainly doesn't include the real meat of like how bad things got. So I, well, that probably I Probably because it was mostly emails. Like they weren't in the same room ever, <laughs> really? which is why they wanted Tony Robbins. But the other thing with that is that um, Joe Berlinger, who directed – some kind of monster with someone else also directed the Tony Robbins movie in 2016. Did so we were this close to even just having another some kind of monster about Blink making neighborhoods. Oh man! Plus, like you know, that, that's also a guy who you know. I mean, he did the Ted Bundy tapes and then the Ted Bundy you know um, uh, scripted film. Is like, wouldn't it have been <laughs> cool if he had done a some kind of monster with Blink and then a scripted adaptation? <laughs> right, yeah, because he clearly just milks the shit out of any idea yeah. that he has going Like, on. Joe, how many Paradise Lost movies are you going to make, buddy? Come on. <laughs> They're free. It's fine now. <laughs> All right, let's quickly talk about the lyrics, because I think that's another thing that has saved me, is there's certain things that have stood out to me in the past that I don't love. I don't like, and this is, this is not just like being a fake woke person i don't think it's funny to call people fat i think it sucks so that i don't like that and we learned on my pet sally that my pet sally is absolutely not about sally from their school but this song is remember like she she's in that mtv documentary right. being like, yeah i i was tom's teacher he's saying a song about me um and it was referring to this one saying kicked old sally because she's fat not um not my pet Sally, which could never be about your school teacher. How would that ever make it any makes, sense? Yeah, but like, nice of you to sort of imagine that. Like, I, I feel like you've protected yourself mentally, and and I think that's important. <laughs> uh, yeah, I totally forgot so I about think, that. So yeah, kicked old Sally because she's fat. Like that line always stands out to me, and I'm like, eh, I don't love it. But and then what else? Something else always bugged me too. I think even just saying I'm a jerk, I'm a punk, I always thought was like too on the nose. But then when I read the chorus all together, I didn't know it opens with the line, don't like hash, don't like rap. That is incredible. <laughs> well, and I'll be honest, I thought the line, like until right before we recorded, then I opened up the lyrics, I thought it was don't like hash. And I was like, well, that's bullshit. I mean, at the time, I didn't like hash, but now I recognize that hash is tight. <laughs> um, but and, and then I so it always sort of bothered me because I was like hash rules and like and being like, I, you know, I like all music except for country and rap or whatever. Like it, it felt it always felt a little <laughs> bit like a rap is crap line to, to me. Um, or at least like as a, I mean, probably when I was in the seventh grade or whatever, I don't think I gave a shit about people saying rap is crap. But. Like, it, again, was, like, another reason to kind of skip the song. But don't like Hesh, don't like rap is so sick. Like, just the idea of, like, I only like fuck. punk. Like, fuck off long yeah. hairs. Like, you know, fuck off rappers. Like, I only skate. That's sick. Like, I'm, I'm totally down with just being, like, that aggressively tribal from a skate punk perspective. Obviously not in a societal perspective. Um, I'm not... Yeah, uh, like race and whatnot. Well, this is why we're uh, know, we're we, engaging with the Breitbart, <laughs> uh, you know, founders. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm still open to picking a side politically, depending on who has the most punk cred, which apparently matters in 2019. Yeah, and I, I also want to shout out uh, Quillet, of course, you know, uh, my favorite Canadian <laughs> publication for truly progressive thought. And, um, you know, whatever <laughs> skull science... Uh, that they're propagating these John days. John K. Yeah. He, John K. Seems pretty punk. Oh, John K. Is super <laughs> punk. Nothing's more punk than wanting to the fuck your mom. The thing is, everyone. Th- <laughs> <laughs> this is deep. Like, there's no way that anyone listening to this gives a shit about John and Barbara K. But you know, for the like ten well, people listening to this podcast, to have an opinion about that. <laughs> that's you. All you gotta know is that they've got punk cred. Like everyone, everyone on Earth has punk cred, and everyone is a punk. I mean, the other thing is like it's kind of. I like that Mark says he doesn't identify as punk, whereas, like, Tom still clearly does, and he'll be like, (laughs) 
I'm wearing sunglasses to a meeting because I'm a, still a punker at heart. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I don't know if this works, man. But, you know, as as we've gone deeper and deeper, you know, are like further up the river on this journey together and, and Green Day comes up a lot and, and we literally just talked about, you know, hitching a ride and, and you know, Billy Joe dropping in on uh, nation punk shows in Oakland, like... I kind of res- I respect people who like feel like no this is this this was my identity and like this will always be important to me as goofy as it seems at some point and so in that sense I feel right. like Tom is is more aligned with Billy Joe who I, I still deeply respect for how much he sort of tries to stay true to a thing you know yeah but I still feel like that's different than being like. Elon Musk being like, I'm a punker. <laughs> yes. Know? Like, it's no, just, that is bad. <laughs> it's so weird. Like, why is everyone trying to be punk? <laughs> it's so good. It I'm is trying to think it, what it will be the confusing. next thing everyone wants to be. Everyone's going to be like, it's kind uh, of like d- beach goth again or health goth or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone's gonna like. There's going to be politicians in ten years being like, I was the first one into a hundred gex. <laughs> yeah, I hope maybe like in four years it'll be like, well, of course, you know, Josiah Hughes is the first uh, Gabber politician and yeah. every, everyone's claiming Gabber. Like being like a, a punk planet esque, uh, like boring ass punk guy, which is what I think when I see Beto, I just think of punk planet. Oh, Beto's and, and so thinking punk like, planet. Yeah. And just like picking up Punk Planet and being like, why did I spend $8 on this? I'm so bored. This is terrible. But he, he reminds me of that. And I feel like trying to be punk is the new like dabbing on Ellen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess like <laughs> everyone agreed that that was embarrassing. Like, you know, Pokemon Go to the polls was no good. And, and now it's all about sort of reminding people that you were in a band with the guy from Mars Volta. Wait, I think it maybe it is because they said that punk would be back because of Trump. And we were expecting it to be musically, but actually oh. it's just like old people trying to seem punk for some reason, which no one wants. It's so strange. I'm actually looking right at, like, I have, I think from when I when I was writing for Exclaim, I got a copy of uh, the complete Punk Planet interviews to review. And nothing has ever felt more like going to school than reading the complete Punk Planet <laughs> interviews. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, respect to Punk Planet. They, publi- they, they just to be totally real, they have published some great stuff, but... Because I, I mostly just think about to like, me, the, the Jess Hopper me, like punk, e- emo where the girls are and is like one of the best like pieces of music writing ever and that's Punk Planet but the rest I of would it say is a, severe. I would say as as long as Beto is still alive we're living in a Punk Planet in my opinion <laughs> that honestly sounds like a threat on Beto's life <laughs> no I'll protect him at all costs <laughs> okay yeah yeah whereas I'm like fear fear of a did, Punk I, Planet. I, I, <laughs> I forgot to say when you were talking about the Hesh thing, I just love abbreviating Hesher to it's Hesh so because good. like that just suggests like an intimate knowledge with the subculture that you would even abbreviate it. Cause I don't know. I don't know about you, but like I never really heard the word Hesher too much in real life. Everyone. And also when I was in high school, everyone was lumped into just being a skid. Like mm. I was a skid and the metalheads were skids and like the ravers were skids. Everyone was just called a skid. I feel like Hesher was one of those words that I heard at some point, decided it was like amongst the greatest words like in the English language. And I use it as often as possible. This is like, um, this is going to sound like I'm being self-promotional, but I know that I put it like numerous times into, into Perfect Youth, into my book. And I, like my editor was like, what the fuck is this? And I was like having to send them Urban Dictionary links to be like, <laughs> please allow me to publish the word Hesher. But I have never heard, ever heard Hesh like used as so like Hesher. Like, I never thought that you could say like metal is Hesh. Like that those like, you yeah. know, so the idea of saying like, I hate, I hate. Hesh, and you're talking about Metallica. Like, that is absolute news to me as of 20 minutes ago, opening up these lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's so cool. It's so sick. Um, like, just, just being like, love that Hesh shit. Like, that, that's great. Like, I'm going to integrate Hesh now into my vocabulary because of this episode, which is very exciting for me, and I'm sure super <laughs> exciting for Ashley. <laughs> um, I'm a jerk. I'm a punk. Took a shower because I stunk. I think that's actually the the two for lines that I've always wrestled with. Because like, in theory, it's funny and good, and I think it does point to this song being a thesis statement for the band at this point. But it's just like really embarrassing to me. 
Yeah, I mean, again, I, I kind of like it because there's a bit of like, I'm a jerk, like I'm cool and punk, but then like, you know, I wasn't smelling my best, and so I cleaned up because I respect those around me. Like, there's something sort of <laughs> very funny about just like, I st- you know, I stunk, so I just wore the same t-shirt for a week. Like, it, acknowledging that, um, you know, hygiene is just sort of an important way of <laughs> respecting yourself and respecting those around you. Um, you know, really jumps out right. at me in, in, in the in the context of what is otherwise, you know, something of a kind of like nihilistic, uh, nihilistic song. Well, the last half of the course is what's making me love it again, because I've never really read it. And it's sort of like the anarchist cookbook. It's kind of so thing. good. Or like, and again, I thought it was so like stupid. I got new war thong. So they're like, it's like a <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Smoked a bong, killed a cat, had my nuts attacked by rats. That's always been a favorite for me because it's like it's one of those things where it's such partial information. <laughs> like what, what, like what was yeah. the scenario in which like your nuts were vulnerable to a rat attack? Like that's interesting to me. I, and there's that. Um, <laughs> I've also never gap, like I've right? never. I've never noticed that line before, and it's yeah, it's completely insane. Not to mention, cat and rats are sort of opposite in a way. So mm. it's kind of a. Playing with old tropes. <laughs> well, and it's. It, I would say that perhaps killing the cat is is what led to the rat infestation because you know a lot of times people will get a cat because not only do they kill mice and kill rats, but even uh, the, their their pheromones um, acts as a deterrent um, to to rodents coming into your home. But in this scenario, you know, perhaps Tom getting high, killing the cat, leads to these rats sort of entering his domicile and going straight <laughs> straight straight for the bag. <laughs> you know, I will say this. Uh, when we lived in a house before we lived in our bougie condo that we live in now, um, there was quite a serious mouse problem. And Woody would just kind of like make us aware that there was mice somewhere by staring at a shelf or a crevice <laughs> of the house for a long time. And then the mouse would come out and he would just continue to stare at it. So he, all he really did was like make us aware of the mice and just kind of watch them for his own entertainment. So it really just added to the anxiety, if anything. That's uh, that's tough, like a pointer, like a like a hunting dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, so I, I thought, so yeah, so Wonka Bong Little Academy, Nuts Have Rats, Dad Got Nude, I Wore a Thong for a Hobby, I Make Bombs. Again, I thought it was, I got nude, like, I got nude, wore a thong. Like, I thought that was all part of him. But the idea that, like, now the dad is involved and, like, Tom's response to his father's <laughs> yeah, nudity just, is to put on a thong. Like, there's just, it's this, like... Like, he's being groomed. He's not ready to be fully nude yet, but he's just being groomed into this inappropriate situation. Like, this is, this is dare I say, like, something of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a Lynchian narrative, you know? Like, can you picture... <laughs> this is, like, very Twin Peaks of the Return, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then to end, like, like, just the left turn of for a hobby, I make bombs, <laughs> yeah. and the fact that it's such a clumsy sentence to fit it in is so dumb that it's good. But uh, like so, so that's the chorus, which is incredible. But I also think like the verse is like you know, kind of kind of whatever. And you got the like you know m- moonlight pun. But I, like, there's something to me like, and I even thought I was walking home listening to the song, and the bit about just like d- like jamming your dick in the door of a cop car is is like also <laughs> legitimately funny. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of like it is. And I'm not going to call it a limerick because it's not a limerick, and I've learned that, and I've always <laughs> known that. Actually, I've always known what a limerick is. Yeah, but limerick there is King something Josiah again. Is. There's something again that this is sort of a tale that someone would write on a bathroom stall. But where Enema of the State like doesn't go far enough. I mean, sorry. Um, what's my age again? Doesn't go far enough with with the. Uh, like idiotic scenarios mm-hmm. Tom has taken it in so many directions and it's almost like jarring how much is going on and every line is so packed full of stupidity yeah yeah totally it's uh it, it's truly incredible just like for for people because I know sometimes people listen to this without uh, uh without listening to the song there are people who listen to this who've not heard a lot of blink songs so just the full line is thrown in the police car and the door slammed no noise just silence as I screamed my dick was jammed that's a great line. Like, that's a really evocative but, picture of just, like, you know, it's all's quiet on the road. The cops close the door. And just <laughs> is, he, is he yelling, my dick's jammed? Like, is that, is that, is that what he exclaimed? That's funny. Right. 
<laughs> also, like, so there's a guy in jail with him named Ben Dover, and it's clearly a gay panic joke, which, like, has not aged no. well. Not that great. But I will say narratively, like, you'd think that he was just piecing together random uh, thoughts that he could come up with. But the fact that verse two <laughs> ends again with seeing Ben Dover again because the police take him away again, like, he's still writing a story here, or dare I say a limerick. Yeah, this is like, and again, the, the gay panic stuff sucks, and so when you were like, there's some lyrics in here I don't like, the stuff about fat, to me, the, the, the like, muttered gay joke is also what's so weird, like, the, the sort of, because the lyric is written out as, uh, you know, the police came, they took me away, saw Ben Dover again, and he's still gay, but in the song, it's like, saw Ben Dover again, he's still gay. Like, he doesn't finish... You never hear right. the why in the recording. Um, and it's just sort of, it's, it's like a shitty, it's a shitty old joke. And, and we don't, we don't think we need yeah, to. Yeah, like, I think, well, both, both, both of those things are like, would be better if he was just continuing to make fun of himself for being a piece of shit instead of like, you know, we don't know what Sally's situation is. We don't need to be talking about that. And yeah, the bend over thing is kind of just like. Okay. Like, it's so much more creative to get your dick jammed in a cop car. Yeah, totally. And again, there's the, this, the part right before it where he's like, so he's in a farmer's field, he's tipping over cows. and, and Which I wanted to ask you about it, because that, to me, also, I guess, kind of triggers me as like a very Abbotsford sort of thing. I, I've never gone tipping cows, but I remember all the older people with eyebrow piercings would always talk about going to tip cows. and just Is like that real? Brings people me back actually to a, did that? I think so. I think I think that's a real thing, or at least they would talk about it as if it was real. Um, but I just like I read this I, as soon as verse two starts. I just smell the punch in the face of manure that you get as soon as you drive past Castle Fun Park on the number one highway <laughs> and you're entering Abbotsford. You can just smell it in the air, and it's like it really bums me out. It just makes me think of like um, shitty eyebrow piercing type guys in like wagon hoodies who <laughs> brag about tipping cows. It's so weird. I also like whenever I, sm- I, I smell that that familiar scent, I, I, I really come back to like being a kid and my parents like driving my sister and I out into the country and like you, you get out of the car and it stinks like shit. And you as a kid be like, this is disgusting. And, they, you know, your parents are just like, that's fresh country air. And that's like their joke. And I would always be like, no, yeah. it's not. It stinks like shit. And I remember <laughs> like eventually getting old enough to be like, ah, oh, they're joking. They don't think this smells good. They know it smells like shit, too. But it took me a, like longer than it should have to realize that like. <laughs> they were. They were just. That they don't actually like. This. <laughs> they don't like. Maybe, the smell do. of Maybe shit. your parents are freaks. <laughs> you know what? Maybe that's, they get off that's on that. True. I don't know. <laughs> We've never had that conversation. I haven't broached uh, 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 <laughs> scat, scat play. play with my parents. <laughs> we can <do> yeah. <laughs> we could, that could be exclusive. Maybe. Yeah, you gotta you That'd gotta pay for uh, for me having to have that conversation. <laughs> Yeah, like in Abbotsford, you can almost smell it. I mean, you can almost taste the smell. Like, it's, like, so intense. Well, I live next to um, a uh, a slaughterhouse in Toronto, which has, you know, been shut down now for two years. But when we moved in, uh, you know, for several years, they're, you know, killing thousands of pigs every day, you know, like, literally right in, in my backyard is why we were able to afford our rent. And... Um, uh, you know, it would some days you could really taste all the all the all the pig shit. Like truly, it was uh, it was, <laughs> yeah, uh, it was an, an oppressive stink. So uh, I'm I'm there with you. But but I, um, I always wondered I also, if, if cow tipping was straight up just like you you know like any like like soggy cookie or whatever. Like one of these things that like people talk about. Like it's a thing that kids do. But do kids actually do any of this shit? I don't know. Do you mean like circle jerking onto a biscuit? Yeah, yeah. And the last person has to eat it. Yeah. No, that's a real Is it? thing. Did you too. do it? I never did it. But See, I, that's the thing. I, do you, do you, I, a friend told me about it that oh, I believe right, because friend, yeah. he was a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, no, I've never done yeah. that. Listen, uh, unless you personally <laughs> jerked off onto a cookie with your friends and then one of you had to eat it, I don't think it's real. So, like, if This is just one of those things where like a sex worker account is going to tweet at you and be like, you're so ignorant. Yeah, stop erasing I, make, I pay my rent by doing culture. the cookie thing. <laughs> <laughs> like probably true. I don't know. Cow tipping has a long, robust uh, Wikipedia entry. Like it's right. insanely long. You kill. This is the the other <laughs> thing is I remember like hearing about it as a kid, and then at some point someone explained to me like, no, it kills the cows, right? Like because they cows can't get up yeah, and it, it breaks it, their ribs and shit. Like it's 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 outrageously cruel, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. You want me to read the entire Wikipedia? I think you should. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know we're in a we're in a, a, a debate crunch, but um, it's actually know. true. But it does say that it's considered an urban legend. But then there's like a bunch of there's so much shit. And in fact, 
The concept of cow tipping apparently developed in the 1970s, though tales of animals that cannot rise if they fall has historical antecedents dating to the Roman Empire. So, uh, wow. you learned like, something here. I like to imagine just spot. some like Roman teens just <laughs> wiling out. <laughs> <laughs> Roman Tip, teens over don't like hash. Ox. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, the the Roman Empire did try to uh, take down one one. Uh, they tried to make one person fall, but they rose again three days later. So it doesn't doesn't always work for the Romans, <laughs> right? That's uh, good. With <laughs> and also, I mean, I will, like you know, uh, the the man to which you're referring, bit of a hash vibe. Like uh, you know, if anybody. <laughs> Got the long hair. It looks good. Um, but, but the line... Well, I don't know if you ever heard the band The Crucified, but he's definitely uh, down with the hash. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So, so there's this line about going to tip, tip cows and, and his pants are down. And then there's this like kind of like funny thing where it... Fe- I don't know like what he's supposed to like rhyme with, but it's like, you know, bent, bends over to, to pick up his pants or whatever, then felt a 12-gauge next to my hum diddy dum and I always thought that was, like, so fun and so playful, and especially as compared to the, like, oh, no. to the near rhyme. Are you serious? I think the hum diddy dum line <laughs> rocks. I love it. I think it's the very The hum diddy dum line makes me want to die, actually. Oh, it makes me want to have a cow tipped onto me. <laughs> no, you're wrong, man. Hum diddy dum <laughs> is, like, the highlight of the song. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, because that's if, if you want. I think. The I guess what he's doing. Song. I think he's trying to. I think the hum diddy dumb thing is him saying that instead of bum. Yeah, it's hard to tell because it's it's up that he's like rhyming with, right? It's like cows down up dumb. I don't know. How's I, this, this? I don't understand how rhyming works. <laughs> what is? Is it called Miss Susie? What is this song that is like? Yeah, yeah. I think it's called Miss Susie. It reminds me of that. So it's like, um, it's, it's, I'm getting these fucking pop up ads trying to sign me up for a newsletter here. <laughs> Miss Miss Susie Miss Susie had a steamboat. The steamboat had a bell. Miss Susie went to heaven. The steamboat went to hello operator. Please oh, give yeah, me number nine. Yeah. If you disconnect me, I'll cut off your behind the refrigerator. The, like so, every time they're about to say a swear. Or not even a swear, just like a word that could almost be construed as a swear. They they change it up, and I think that might be the kind of thing that he's doing here. Of like, instead of saying bum, he's gonna say hum diddy dum. But like, he's also willing to say all kinds of other crazy shit in the song. So I don't, I still don't really get it why he's only censoring arguably the least offensive thing said in the entire song. Yeah, absolutely. And then there also is, sorry, there's the bend over gay panic, and then there's the farmer shows him the closet from the inside out, which is like, you know, I mean. As as gay panic jokes from the late '90s go, is like fairly benign, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> like that's the standard, you know, of, of, that we have to sort of judge this against. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think we've covered the lyrics. I think we're not, good. Yeah, not, they haven't aged that well, uh, but there are su- there are some surprising left turns that make them pretty great. Some of the stuff's but not great, but, I, but think- the stuff that works is amongst the funniest. Like I would say, blink lyrics, like especially as compared to something like "What's My Age Again," which is like half cock jokes. Like this is like again, uh, like paints a very vivid picture. A uh, lot of lot of good stuff about fucking up your own dick. Like that's always funny. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, like it's like some good. of it is some of it. Some of it feels very clever in, in in the sense that it's like there's these wild left turns that you wouldn't expect. And then it's and then that makes the gay panic stuff seem even more lazy. I think that's what it is. Right. It's like, you know, uh, again, like had my nuts attacked by rats, like always has jumped out at me. It's just like such a like fun <laughs> and bizarre thing to say. <laughs> For a hobby, I make bombs is really good, too. For, yeah, that actually true. really reminds me of Abbotsford as well. Like, uh, I had this friend in Abbotsford who also was a cow tipper type of guy. I don't know if he ever did it, but he hung out with all those people. And he was really obsessed with, like, buying saltpeter, which is, like, uh, I think it's some form of um, fertilizer or something. But it's, like, actually, like, he probably got added to some lists for it because it's used in, like, literally building bombs. And he wanted to buy it. He would buy it and I think just, like, make 
crazy smoke bombs on this farm. These are the kind of people who have, like, potato cannons, too. Amazing. Did you ever, like, when you kind of, like, <laughs> started getting online, like, I feel like downloading the Anarchist Cookbook was, like, sort of a thing that everyone did to just be like, I can make napalm now. Like, did you ever, did you ever? <laughs> yeah, totally. You must have had the I Anarchist definitely did. Cookbook, I, remember, right? I remember walking through Seven Oaks Mall in Abbotsford, and there was, like, Cole's Books or whatever had, like, a little, um... Uh, you know, they would put, like, the sale books in the hallway of the mall. And it would just be oh, right yeah, there, yeah, like, yeah. not in the store, but in the hallway. And I walked by and, like, uh, and like I've said before, I've never really stolen anything before because I'm such a good holy boy. <laughs> um, but but I saw in that thing, they had a copy of, um, is it called Steal This Book? Oh, or yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah. By, like, Abby Hoffman or whatever. And I just stood there and had this, like, moral crisis for, like, ten minutes. <laughs> And then my mom was done at whatever store she was at, and we just left. But I still think about that, being, like, faced with a book that says, steal this book on it. But, like, can I steal it or not? What is the rule? <laughs> right, you're like, I don't know, I was taught to believe books, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. All of these ideas are in conflict with each other. But these are, like, the kind of, uh, like, debates that a suburban punk has. Absolutely. It's never about anything valuable, it's like... I go to church, but also this book says that I should steal it. <laughs> I also <laughs> love that you shouted out Cole's Books, which I don't know if that was a Canada-only chain. I mean, I remember there was a Cole's Books in the Cloverdale Mall in Etobicoke. Uh, big, big, Whoa, big there's fan. a Cloverdale Mall? Yeah. Is there an area called Cloverdale? It's not, no, it's not like in the Cloverdale region. It, it's uh, the Only the mall uh, is, is Cloverdale. But there's a Zeller's there. Shout out Zeller's. Because there's a, there's a Cloverdale uh, sort of in the Fraser Valley around Abbotsford and Langley. I think between the two. No, maybe, no, not between. The, I don't really get where Cloverdale is, but it's around there somewhere. Cool. Well, sh- so shout, shout out, out to, to Clover- all Cloverdales. <laughs> Generally, just like shout out to the suburbs. I was hanging out with, uh, oh my God, here it comes, the official fourth mention. I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> Over the weekend, I was hanging out with Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> and I was remembering some of the shit we used to do. Um, and I just had this moment where I was like, damn, I was like so rural as a kid. Like, I can't (laughs) believe the kind of shit that I used to, I'm trying to say it in like the nicest terms possible. Um, but like one of the, one of our hobbies was we would like just go to dumpsters and get giant fluorescent light bulb tubes and then take them to the mall parking lot and throw them and watch them shatter. And they would, like, smoke would rise. Like, there's some chemical in it that makes it smoke when it shatters. So we yeah, just, like, yeah. shatter. <laughs> like, just, like, literally, like, one time we found, like, 50 of them and we just, like, shattered them all. And he was like, what? what kind of life is this? Maybe I should have been drinking instead. I mean, like, that is, like, typically the trajectory, I think, is you, like, go from that into, like, drinking, into huffing glue, you know, into being, like, really stoked on your truck. Yeah. Instead, I just, like, shattered those fluorescent light bulbs and then went to church. (laughs) That was my (laughs) That's the good balance. That's, like, that's a very, like, suburban, but, like, yeah, rural suburban dig through the garbage for shit to smash. (laughs) Yes. So good. Um, so this song, I guess, kind of feels still, even though the lyrics are surprisingly complex, it kind of feels like a song that they just tossed off in the studio yeah, for Dude Ranch. It, it, it has like, you know, it, again, it's a little more nuanced musically than I think I remembered it being just by virtue of like not listening to it a lot over the last couple of years. Um, but mostly it just kind of feels like a, a fairly rudimentary foundation to like sing like sort of dumb lyrics on top of like it, it, none of this feels like right. it's been super fussed over except another thing that fucking rocks in this song is the riff at the end like the, it's got this insanely good like dude ranch era tom riff that like yeah. i almost feel is wasted here because you know some songs have just like a fucking sick bridge and you listen to it to kind of get that satisfaction I don't think I'm ever going to listen to Degenerate to get to the, like, very last 15 seconds of it to hear that riff. But imagine that riff, like, transposed into a different song as, like, the setup to some, like, sick actual song as opposed to, like, a, a rat rat bag song. It's weird, too, because whenever people talk about, like... Um modern skate punk that's like a throwback or when people you know we've talked about how people make a like newfound glory rip off and say that it sounds like blank but it's also like i've heard people lately doing like skate punk impressions that sound exactly like the satanic surfers or whatever but there's still something about dude ranch 
that cannot be mimicked or imitated and can I almost can't even put my finger on what is happening on this album with those guitar riffs and with the production and with the drumming and everything i i can't really figure out what it is but i feel like it can't be mimicked and even whenever blink 182 tries to do an impression of themselves including with the newest pop punk song like the new blink 182 song sounds like i don't even know bad religion or something but i feel like there's something about dude ranch that is so it does silly not and sound like bad religion that. i guess we can't talk with that <laughs> uh, that that 50 we'll, second yeah, song we'll gets fight a whole about that episode, another time yeah what the fuck are you talking yeah. about well, either either way, there's something like so magical about Dude Ranch that it can't be replicated. I don't understand. I I can't really like after all this time I still can't figure out what this album sounds like other than itself. No, you're you're totally right and that's why like all of these I don't know, there's, there's a bit of like the 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 horrid cliche of kind of like chasing the dragon like that there is like part of like our our emotional attachment to it is nostalgic but i think we're like uh objective enough as like music fans and people who have like written and thought about music and have embarrassingly enough in a professional way for like over a decade each like there's nothing there is nothing like this like even this dumb tossed off kind of hash rap song there's not there's nothing like it and that's you're right it's like it, it, and what is it it's something about like the way that the guitar is being played like the way that those riffs like you know are, are structured the approach to the lyrics the the sort of combination of the three of them the way Scott plays drums like you know it's it, it's not even like a simple like I think about I was, I was talking to somebody recently about like you know Vinny from Less Than Jake uh his like style of drumming which is like so straightforward, like Less Than Jake songs have kind of like barely like no fills. It's just like like that's it the whole time. And like Scott sort of has that, except he's got the like really super fast fills. And then a song like this shows that like he has really strong like technical fundamentals. He just never gave enough of a shit or or never thought it was appropriate to like try to flex them. But they're they're like they're apparent, and somehow all of those things are like. Uh, they come together in a way that like n- literally no one else has been able to, to, to reproduce. A- yeah. a- and, and I don't, I don't think that's hyperbolic. No, like, because it's not just taking some aesthetic things and then redoing them. There's something about this album that sounds like the feeling of getting older and being like the show, going to a show isn't the same as it used to yeah, be. Or whatever. Yeah. There's just like, it sounds nostalgic and depressing in a in a great way, but it's like it's just really bizarre. But anyways, I was saying the song sounds like it's tossed off, but actually this is their third recording of it. That right? Yeah, Ranch. yeah, yeah. Because this is this is in the demos. Like this is this is out there. Yeah. So the so I'm gonna play the. Uh, it's on the original Buddha demo, but it's not on the remaster of it. It's just on the original shitty version, and then it's also on demo number two. But the Buddha one is interesting because Mark sings the chorus. So I'm gonna oh, play sick. that. Also, like, got my I screamed my butt was jammed. Like, that's the original lyric. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> like, that's and very also he funny. said Benjamin. He said Benjamin, and that's funnier. Of that's over. funnier because it sort of forces that, you that to, to to process the joke a, a little more. Like, but I will say this: <laughs> so it's 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 like one step forward, one step back. Because sl- I, to be honest, screaming my butt is actually maybe both of those are funnier. Like. <laughs> Getting a butt jammed <laughs> in a door? <laughs> That's actually really funny. 
Yeah, that's more like Simpsons-y because you can't really <laughs> pick, like, the dick one, you can immediately picture it, but the butt one, you're, like, stuck with it for a while. Like, what does that <laughs> yeah. even mean? How do you get your butt stuck in a door? Yeah, so, so it's like, you have to do um, more heavy lifting. I wonder if that was, like, you know, the label, like, MCA being like, listen, people, people, <laughs> kids, like, your fucking fans are not going to be able to process Benjamin Dover and a, and a butt <laughs> getting slammed in a door. So just, you know, can you, can you streamline this for the kids, please? We can't have we can't, look your song degenerate. It's too smart. We, it's it's way too smart. <laughs> we need you to dumb it down. I mean, it seems that, and that was when they know? sold out right there. That, that was, was when it. they sold out. It's incredible to be able to down. sort of to 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 actually pinpoint the moment <laughs> in a band's career. Uh, yeah, when they gave up their ideals, but that was definitely it. Was uh, was the the dick butt swap? <laughs> so they did. They recorded it three times and. They seem to be obsessed with it, and then I guess probably because damn it happened, they just sort of like got rid of it. But they've played it live, apparently only twice. Really? Um, and I have a video here of them, of them playing it live in San Diego at Soma. Oh, but what I was thinking with that recording too is like the the thing that we haven't really talked about is how it is the tension of like the nursery rhyme sounding guitar and then the pop punk part kicking in. And so when Mark sings the chorus, it actually makes more sense because you go from Tom's like kindergarten teacher voice to like a cool pop punk guy voice yeah totally and and uh it, it's so interesting though that they would record the song three times like so clearly they thought it was good and and worth sort of carrying over through like various iterations <laughs> of the band but then to be like but it's not good enough to play live is fucking weird right <laughs> yeah because if anything the the slow fast thing seems made for playing live yeah like it, it's like designed like you get some fun and like it just seems built around like being able to do like good bands and and, and like some ad libs and stuff and so to just be like no no this is just like a, an album track meant to be savored you're <laughs> like what all right cool right. cool <laughs> well let's hear how it sounds this is uh july 27th 95 <laughs> audience singing along. You should. You got to listen to everyone needs to. If you want to learn how to dress, listen to the uh, Blink One Eighty Two Fits reviews that I just did with Sexual Jumanji. People f- on the were Patreon. freaking about that. People love that that exclusive, <laughs> man. Well, it's because Sex J dropped some knowledge and some heart. I think. Wow. <laughs> uh, that's uh, a, a, a truly delightful combination. I feel like I might actually listen to that one. <laughs> Look, so I know we got a time crunch, so I'm only going to play a couple of the uh, off-topic things oh, that I found. Oh, fuck me. God damn it. <laughs> uh, this one I think is quite good, actually. I was hoping to play it beneath the whole episode. I kind of <laughs> forgot, but this is uploaded by um, PRI Public Radio International in 2008. And these people are fucking cooking. This is called the Degenerate Music Concert. <laughs> Imagine if it had been in the background the whole time. Oh, this would have been great. I feel like we should, should... You want to start the episode over? Maybe I could add it in after. I don't get it. These people are Underneath. not degenerates. They are all very proper. Is that the joke? Yeah, but I think it's like one of those... No, I think like in the... It's sort of like how uh, Beto thinks that he's punk. Is like in the realm of classical music, everyone is so stuffy and stuck up that if you start fucking shredding like Joe Satriani, like these people are doing, then you're a degenerate all of a sudden. Oh. That's my guess. Yeah, this guy's like kind of headbanging while playing violin, even though he's in like an all white suit. So look at the two comments on this. <laughs> so uh, one guy <laughs> says, ah, yes, the soul of my people. Um, and then Alan S. wrote, disgusting. <laughs> Damn, you're right. People Damn, were really, appalled uh, by, by them just fucking, fucking 
shredding. <laughs> There's a lot of gatekeepers in the world of uh, degenerate music. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <clears throat> This one I was like, I don't know if I should play, but then I saw the title of the song, and I was like, okay, I'm definitely playing this. So I searched, trying to find covers, I searched Blink-182 Degenerate on, on Bandcamp, and there were none, but I found um, <laughs> the rapper Illin Degenerate. Oh um, and this God. is from <laughs> Illin Degenerate's song, Kelowna Fornia. So shout out to so uh, the Okanagan. I don't know if we, I don't <laughs> know if we have anyone listening from the Okanagan or like from Osoyas or something. If you're out there, uh, shout us. You out. know what's Let crazy? Know. I, I was we, thinking about like you know the 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 geography of the pod, right? And there was somebody posted, uh, or I think it was like uh, 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 Mitty uh, uh, posted in the in the Blink Fifty Five unofficial Facebook group so, some uh, something about him being on like a, a local radio show to like talk pop punk and, and talk about the pod and and the, this post. <laughs> yeah. From the show was like you know Mitty Rendell you know uh, you know put putting Wodonga on the map you know like basically uh, you know it's become like a cult part of this of this podcast and I was like damn that's true like Blink One Fifty Five I know like you've been hitting up the mayor and stuff but like I, like Wodonga is an important part of Blink One Fifty Five and I was just like kind of amazed thinking about how um, like the, the ability to sort of manifest um, like. Uh, important pieces of, of, of the pod. Like if anyone just like sort of tweets at us enough, like it just becomes like, like that. So Wodonga <laughs> yeah. is now like, that, like if does Wodonga have a Wikipedia page? Like in my mind, it's too small, but like under like culture, it would be like, you know, Wodonga frequently referenced on the, <laughs> yeah, that's all. I, I just, wonder. Just and also maybe someone could add geography. that to the wiki. Yeah, Whoa, yeah, yeah. So if, if anybody here has like uh, like good cred and on Wikipedia, I think it's like at this point this this podcast should be part of the Wodonga uh, Wikipedia entry. So that, sorry, I'll you let you play your like off topic on there. Now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, please. This is a uh, Illin Degenerate with California. Featuring two joints. Yeah. What up, Kelowna? Ha <laughs> ha. We back, baby. <laughs> two joints. Billy Degenerate. Dr. Gigglebite. It's the summertime. And we in K-Town. That's what's up. You know how we do. We about to blow the roof off like we live in Iraq, baby. Word to your mother. So I showed this song to uh, Alex earlier. Um, and he pointed out something that I don't know if you could hear. But he said... We're in K-Town, about to blow this joint up like we're in Iraq, is what he said. Sick. Illin Degenerate. <laughs> uh, like, he's got bars. <laughs> Kelowna Fornia yeah, he does is start rapping honestly so... That's, is, is that like a known nickname <laughs> for Kelowna, though? <laughs> I, I certainly hope not. I mean, there's... Oh, my God, maybe. There's at least one other rap song called Kelowna Fornia. Okay, so this is, so this is a whole thing. <laughs> You should write an article about the Kelowna rap scene and see how many death threats you get this time. Maybe, yeah, maybe you can get more. Yeah. Um, maybe, the, maybe people in Kelowna. Okay, we got to hear the other. So this is a dollar D. Yeah, I want to compare. Who's got the better Kelowna for you? Yeah. West Coast. <laughs> it's so pathetic yeah. to see like a BC driver's Kelowna license Bay driver's Bay plate Bay in a music video. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is way yeah. better. You know how, like, you know how people, like, uh, like people who are sort of like passively racist or racist in a way that they think they're not racist because it's more like um, what's the word subconscious. Like people who are like, "Oh, he's scary" because they see like a black person and that looks like a rapper, and like, "Oh, he's scary." When I see these like bald, hell's angel ass Kelowna rappers, these these white guys with like terrible. Famous stars and straps tattoos. That's the scariest possible rapper <laughs> on earth right. to me. <laughs> yeah, you're bringing, you're bringing a lot of baggage to that. I think, but but I, I don't I don't think that's an unreasonable take. 
Whatever kind of car you're driving down the Coca Hollow, they will strip it. They're gonna steal your rims no matter what you're driving. I can guarantee it. This is like very, very inside BC shit, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so those were those those Colonifornia is the song we're talking about this week. <laughs> that was um, like a quite illuminating, to be honest. I really enjoyed that little uh, that little detour. Well, I got two more from the non thing, and then I'm just going to play only a couple. There's not very many good covers cool. of this, uh, although there are some too, as we know, as Ooh. we'll soon find out. Um, but it is comedy season, so I need to play you this, um, just as a reminder of like we think that Blink One Eight Two's comedy music is quite bad, but uh, it could get a lot worse. Um, this is Stucky and Murray. I don't know Murray that I need to hear their... more comedy music to know that comedy music is bad. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, I'm just saying it could be a lot worse than Blink-182. Like, this makes uh, every Blink-182 joke song seem like a masterpiece. So this is uh, Stucky and Murray. Um, they offer a musical olive branch to their female oh, critics. No. And this is from the Degenerate Comedy Channel, uh, uploaded in 2009. Here we go. Just start my heart. die so badly right now. Death would almost be too kind. This, but also, this is what I picture whenever people try to tell me that Jack Black is good. <laughs> right, so. is he picture <laughs> Sticky and <laughs> Sticky and Murphy? <laughs> That's like all musical com- And also, remember like as a society when we used to pretend that Flight of the Conchords was good and it's all just that, like you just like list daily activities in the form of a song <laughs> and people are like that's hilarious no, but especially if you <laughs> harmonize people are like this is yeah. transcendent and you're like uh, and you, if you're in New Zealand and you're like I'll put the cucumber I can't do a New Zealand accent yeah, right now but you know good. imagine I am <laughs> and they're just singing about like putting things in the vegetable crisper or whatever <laughs> Like, putting away groceries, and people are like, oh, my God, that's so true. I do put my vegetables in the crisper. <laughs> I'm going to do way more of, like, what you just did, which is like, hey, just imagine that I did this particularly funny thing. You know? <laughs> Theater of yeah, the mind. it's great. You know, I, I think it's important to use your <laughs> imagination. Really, you and I do too much heavy, listi- heavy lifting for listeners, and I think um, it's, just it's imagine so your own jokes, please. I, I also just want to add in the spirit of honesty that usually the vegetable crisper in my fridge is does have some sort of mystery liquid forming in it, so I don't put vegetables <laughs> yeah. in there. Just just for the sake of transparency. I mean, I just never have vegetables um, in the house. Yeah, there you go. Okay, finally, before I play you some covers, it is punk season as well, um, so i got to play this. This is from 1993. It's a band called Scud with their song, Degenerate, and they're playing in Luxor Karlovac? Is that a place, maybe? Or is that who uploaded it? It seems like it's from Croatia or something. Um, but it's so sick. I don't even understand the video. It's so good. video is so the, unbelievably cool. This is sick. Because it's sort of like got like a, a, a sort of like, you know, first wave hardcore vibe to it. But it's like there's a big thing behind them that says Rock 93. And it's like very, it's like a very 90s. I don't, I don't, this is so cool. Scud Yeah, rocks. and also the singer, like, 
The singer looks like a fucking badass, but he also has a music stand with a sheet <laughs> on it. So I don't know if he's like reading the lyrics. And then the rest of the band is like dressed like a non-punk character from Degrassi <laughs> Junior right. High. Like they they just like they don't look punk in any way, and that's what makes them so punk. I would love it if Blink One Eighty Two was so desperate to be punk again that they had a song with like this kind of discharge vocals too. So okay, I don't know. This is like from some something that's like uh, it's being posted. So Luxor, I mean Luxor is in Egypt, um, but what this is actually the channel is Karlovac not LA. So it's it's a it's like a blog called This is Karlovac not LA. Where is Karlovac? Karlovac. Oh well, check this out actually. Um, it Croatia. looks like this Karlovac Scott. is in Croatia. So yeah, this is a Croatian hardcore band playing in 1993. That's fucking sick. And also, there was a cassette uh, in 1994 of this live show recorded. Oh, I believe. cool! Yeah, that's fucking awesome. Yo, like, is Croatian hardcore fucking rad as hell? <laughs> Apparently, I don't know. I'm not seeing much about Scud on here. They've just been on like three different. Cassettes, well, even like Karlovac. Uh, Scud is cool. Karlovac is a city in Croatia of 55,000 people. So this is like a small town in Croatia with a whole blog dedicated to its hardcore scene. Called This is Karlovac, not LA, I which is like legitimately fucking cool. Hey, Sam. I wonder if they I... do cow Oh, Ashley says there. hey. Oh, hey, Ashley. That's so nice of you. Usually she doesn't say hi to me. That's very, I feel so honored. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, sometimes she's got to give you a little bit, a, a, a little bit just to <laughs> satisfy you. Um, okay, well, do you want to get into some covers or what? Yeah, man. Because <laughs> you seemed un- so you so seemed unprepared uh, there for a second. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna lie. It's mostly acoustics. So I'm very confused by everything. Oh, um, but because actually, I'm not gonna do that first. I'm gonna do this first. I I was disappointed with all the acoustic ones that I found, and so I thought, you know what? I'm gonna go deeper. I'm gonna, in the words of Delirious, I, I'm gonna dig deeper or something. What? Uh, I think that's the lyrics. Anyways, um, that's just for the the Christian heads. Um, but I found. Blinkfest live in the Philippines on oh, Vimeo. Shit. So I, I started searching the what the uh, video sites that I don't normally search. I found Blinkfest in the Philippines. This was uploaded nine years ago. Um, oh, yeah, it took place in 2010. Now, you'd think, oh, that'll be easy to find because it has the track listing underneath. Well, the track listing is listed in a different order than how it appears <laughs> on the video. So I've been skipping around <laughs> all day <laughs> trying to find this. Uh, but I finally found... What are they called? Import the World. That is so extremely has... English as a second language punk band name. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. They have broken up recently, but their original tunes kind of sound almost like Monine or something. Oh, okay. Um, but this is them. This is them covering Degenerate at Import the World, and like weirdly, very few pop punk bands have covered this song. So, so thank God bless the Philippines. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Adding to the charm, the drummer is wearing a yellow M&M shirt, and the bassist is wearing an Elmo shirt. Amazing. Um, Sh- so shout so, out, shout out yeah. Al's Bar in Peranak City in the Philippines. If you do Blinkfest again, uh, consider inviting um, <laughs> one of the internet's many <laughs> Blink-182 podcasts to have Mark Hoppus on it. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, he's done them all. It's not even special anymore. But we are the first one to have three guests on one episode. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, so, we're innovating um, <laughs> in the Blink-182 podcast space. <laughs> So the other thing I was going to play is, like, just out of respect for the internet itself, uh, we got to play the Nightcore version oh, of the song. hell yeah. Especially because it has 182 views. Wow. 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 Paul Biederman uploaded this uh, in 2017, and it sounds sick. <laughs>
obviously. That is fantastic. so sick. A Nightcore is really good. I think it might be the best genre. It is genre. good. Who do you think is going to be the first political candidate to claim Nightcore? <laughs> now that, now that, they'll get my vote. Of course, I can't vote for um, American politicians. So, and, and the thing is, in Canada, none of them claim anything. They're just like, oh, I like the Tragically Hip and I like Nickelback. Yeah, that's equally. <laughs> yeah, just playing it as safe as possible, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, we don't get to have these, like, big debates in Canada, unfortunately. I wish it, I wish people were trying to prove their cred with their, uh, I don't know, Spotify.ca playlists or whatever. No, and it's all it's that is is just the Tragically Hip discography. And you're like, yup. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. A good old boy. This yeah, politician's Justin's a good old boys, Canadian eh? boy. Yeah. <laughs> this, this episode is really dedicated to, like, uh, small cities in Canada, I think. <laughs> all, the, uh, all the cow tippers. This this episode has extreme shoe swap energy. <laughs> I think. Hell yes. Um, okay, so the last one I'm gonna play you before we do something very special is um, this is like all instrumental acoustic, so we at least get to hear the melody without the the. Uh, hurtful language that appears in the song and I'm talking about the badum diddy dum <laughs> of, co- of course and and the fat <laughs> and the fat phobic <laughs> remark those are those are the right the elements that and you parti- Benjamin Dover. particularly objected to <laughs> um okay so this is Nico wait <laughs> wait a minute how do you pronounce this name with the umla k a s is this person's name literally Nico Case but spelled K A S with an umla do you think this is Nico Case do you think cuz you can't see their face is, in the in the her, video it's Nico Case's Finsta but on YouTube um, Holy shit. where she just does acoustic covers of degenerate by blink 182 spaced out because it was so delightful yeah i mean i've always loved nico's uh like more traditional material but this is like <laughs> this is re- a really excellent use of her talent so like shout out shout out nico case come on the pod sometime <laughs> yeah shout out nico case love the uh different spelling you've gone with for your finsta but we found you so um <laughs> that would honestly be super sick like I, I you look at i mean i get that it's real and it's happening so it is sick but like just sort of imagine <laughs> Which is easy to do because it's true. Because <laughs> it's happening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't have a very good imagination, so thank God it's it's real. <laughs> um, so, so there is a final cover. Yeah. Normally, I would save the. Normally, I would have found the uh, like cool indie cover of it that that redeemed the song and made sense of everything on my own. But it doesn't exist online until right this second because. We've got the debut drop online of Colleen Green's uh, Degenerate cover from her recent Dude Ranch cover album. Colleen, thank you for joining Blink-155. Once again, you are now part of a, a, a rarefied group of people who have been on the pod twice. You're like basically royalty. So I guess congratulations uh, to you on this stunning achievement. Oh, wow. Thank you. What an honor. <laughs> so uh, you are talking to me from where? You're on tour with Potty Mouth right now. I am. Uh, I'm in Chicago right now. Hell yes, love Chicago. Where are you? Where are you? Uh, where are you playing tonight? I'm playing at a place called Sleeping Village that I've never been to before. I believe it to be somewhat new. Hell yeah, this is immensely useful information for me to be giving people, given that the earliest someone will hear this episode is two days after you've played there. But uh, I think it's important. <laughs> Important context, because it's like this is like a, a, a road report uh, as, as you mosey your way through America and Canada on this tour. Yeah. So how's uh, how's how's the tour been so far? Are the Dude Ranch tapes flying off the merch table? Like, you know, give us uh, give us an update. 
You know, actually, uh, I have to say I'm pretty bummed because I was supposed to have the Dude Ranch tape on June 7th. It's now June 26th, and I still do not have the tape. This is bullshit. Is there, like, a number people can call? Is there, like, a, a duplication plant that we can maybe, like, flood with uh, with complaints, get them to hurry the fuck up? I wish, but I feel like if any, if, if people were to do that, they would just, it would just cause them to just take their sweet time <laughs> even that much more. Um, I've been bugging them, and I'm really not getting anywhere, and um, I'm not happy about it at all. I, I booked this tour pretty much just to be able to sell those tapes and that was kind of my thing that I was going to be pushing on this tour and we're a week in I don't have them yet and I'm not going to have them still for another week so and the people aren't being very cooperative I mean apparently there's a shortage of tape now because so many people are making cassettes now and so that's why but I got the tracks in like at least like I think like three months before it was supposed to come out so I don't know I feel like they had plenty of time, but hey, what do I know? Yeah, jokes aside, that is like super, I'm just a super musician. fucking. <laughs> yeah, you're not a t- tape duplicator, but that is like insanely fucking frustrating. That sucks. It's really annoying. Yeah, but oh well. What well, are you gonna I'm... do? I'm just telling people that they can add their names to a mailing list if they want to prepay me. They can give me money on the spot, and then I'm taking their uh, names and addresses, and I'll ship the tapes to them when I have them. That's fucking awesome. Well, I know for sure, like, that oh. uh, a, a large portion of the people who listen to this podcast, I'm sure, would be stoked to order it, especially knowing that it's been frustrating uh, for you on this tour, too. So, like, I guess it's still up for pre-order on the Burger Record site. So is that where people who are hearing this now should go to listen to it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to put it up on Bandcamp, too, at some point. Um, but I'll I'll post about it, so... People just need to follow me on social media, I guess. Or, yeah, they can just go to Burger Records. Hell yeah. So, I mean, some context for someone who didn't hear uh, the last time you were on the pod. You told us about how you had recorded this tribute to Dude Ranch a couple of years ago, and then your computer crashed and you lost the whole fucking thing. And then, like, secretly over the last year, you've basically been tooling away and you and you re-recorded it. Can, can you tell me a little bit about the process of going back and, like, revisiting this thing that you already, like, 90% accomplished and, and, and how it was different? How, was it better? Was it worse? Like, what was this process like? for you uh yeah it was really hard um the hardest part was just having the wherewithal to like go back to it because i was so it's actually this has been over the course of like almost 10 years i would say maybe like eight years or or something i'm not exactly sure i think it was in 2012 when i first or maybe early 2013 when i first started the project and i gave myself two weeks to, to finish it um, I had it almost done. I just had to record a couple more vocals, lost the whole thing. And yeah, ever since then, I just was so depressed about it. And so just like angry and upset with myself that I let that happen due to my carelessness, which is just like super stereotypical of me. Um, but yeah, I just couldn't go back to it. Every time I tried, I was just like, it's not the same. I can't do it. Whatever. I'll just do it later. But then years and years went by and I still didn't get it done. Um, but yeah, being on the, the Blink-155 podcast really motivated me to just get it done. Because it, it was something that I have been wanting to really, really do for years. And I just, like, I had this kind of, like, mental blockage that was preventing me from finishing it for a really long time. But yeah, I just had to kind of like put my mind to it and say, this is something that I really want to do. I've been saying I'm going to do it forever. And especially now that it was out on your podcast and now that like a lot of people knew about it, I figured I just had to get it done. But I think in the end it all turned out for the best because right now it comes at a time where I'm in between albums I am going to be recording a new album really soon. And so this will be kind of just like, you know, um, a little, a little fun little thing in between. And I think it's better this time because I really just was able to take my time on it. I didn't try to rush it like I did before. Just like, I'm going to get this done in two weeks. And um, I think that the end result this time around is way better than whatever I had before. 
Oh, that's fucking awesome. I like that no matter what, though, it's been a journey of pain for you. Like, first losing it and now the tape frustration. Like, this was never going to be an easy journey for you, I guess. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess that's good, too, because it made me really appreciate everything about it. That's awesome. And honestly, like I it, like you had emailed me when you finished doing it. And I was so stoked that the pod, which mostly puts out just uselessness into the world, uh, might be uh, might be <laughs> part of, of bringing this like insanely cool fucking idea, uh, you know, back into reality. So uh, I'm stoked that that's like maybe something maybe something positive that we've uh, that we've now finally been a yeah. part of. Totally. And, and thank you. You should. Yeah, you should give yourself a little tiny little pat on the back it's it'll be a modest pat but i assure you any opportunity i have to congratulate (laughs) myself on something i fucking go for it now you yeah there's like a a, an iconic iconic photo of you in the the, uh, self-made scott rayner t-shirt and scott did also post a bet when you sort of put up a kind of like uh mysterious like photo of blink like oh i've got something doing i feel like scott scott shared that right so like has scott been aware of this process at all like what what's your communication with with scott rayner been like um yeah i don't know if that fan that that scott rayner page on facebook is really him or not I'm oh not so is sure. that just that's just I've like some scott rayner fan facebook page <laughs> i'm not yeah i don't know i I've never really talked to him about, like, social media or anything. Um, but, yeah, he or some someone on the Scott Rayner fan page, like, shared that post where I just – I posted a picture of Blink-182. To me, it was a picture of Blink-182, and I said, I've been working on something very secret for a very long time, and I'm going to tell you guys about it very soon. And since Scott was in the foreground of the picture, everybody thought that, like, we were working on something together, which is – Still a dream of mine, um, and that would be, I mean, obviously, that he's, like, the best drummer in the world, so if I could work with him, that would be great, um, but, yeah, I, I hope that can happen someday. Well, I'm not sure, though. Clearly, the pod is a little bit of a, like, um, uh, dream weaver, right? Like, you put it out into the pod, and, like, you know, you get the Dude Ranch tribute record done, maybe it could be part of uh, making, making the Scott Rayner dream fully come true. You never know. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll see. Um, he he does know about the the covers album though, the Dude Ranch cover album. I sent it to him. Uh, he didn't men- mention that he listened to it or anything like that, but I, I did share it with him. That's so sick. So we're gonna hear. So, so basically, like I didn't realize. So no one has really had this yet, but you have done us the immense kindness, honored us by letting us share your cover of Degen- Degenerate in this week's episode. So before we play it, is like, do you have like any sort of uh, feeling towards this song this is obviously sort of like a, a like a kind of a joke blink song um you know where does it sit in the hierarchy of dude ranch songs for you like uh what, what was the process of covering degenerate like um well i don't know i was i kind of had a moral dilemma when i started covering this one because yeah as i started to like I mean, even before I started covering it, I, I, I know, obviously, what the lyrics entail. And mm-hmm. I kind of was like, I had pause. And I just was like, is this okay? Like, should I cover this one? Or, like, is this not okay to just, like, perpetuate in this day and age? Should I leave it out? But I, I don't know. I, I did struggle with it a little bit. But ultimately, I decided that it wouldn't be dude ranch without degenerate. And I don't know. Um, it doesn't really like mean anything to me. I'm not trying to like perpetuate any, any like derogatory behavior or language or anything like that. I don't know. People, some people might say that I can see how they would, but this probably isn't for those people. So I don't know. I, I, think I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's something that exists. And it's not like I can't uncreate it. I can't unmake it. It's something that exists, and it is what it is. You know. I think uh, I think if you're doing the Dude Ranch tribute, it, I, I think you made the right call. I mean, Josiah and I just spent you know a good amount of time kind of dissecting the like you know, whatever fat phobic gay panic stuff that's in this song, which obviously sucks, but it's, it's there. Yeah. It's part of this classic album. And I think, I think it's, I think it is fair and just, uh, that, you know, obviously you're aware of that, but I mean, I think you, you got to cover it. So, you know, if I yeah, may I, right I, call. 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, I'm, it would have been weird if I left it out. And like, it, I feel like that even would have been like too obvious if I had left it out. Yeah, totally. Like, I don't know, like pandering or something almost, or I'm not really sure, but, um, I did change one lyric in there to just kind of like, I guess a little, have a little concession or a little compromise. So you'll hear that. Maybe. Amazing. Well, so, so we're going to play that. I like the song. I like the song. So it's got a sick riff at the end. The riff at the end is very good. Yeah. I love, yeah. The solo at the end is fucking awesome. So. Okay. So people are going to hear this. This is like not even out yet. Um, you mentioned people can follow you on your socials for updates on it. It's available for pre-order through Burger. You're on tour right now. When this episode comes out on Friday, where where in the world are you? Uh, let me think. The Friday? What's the date on Friday? It's you know? the 28th. Friday the 28th. The 28th, I believe I'll be in Pittsburgh. Hell yeah. So what's up to Pittsburgh today on the day this comes out? And if you're not in Pittsburgh, you're sort of up in the general kind of Northeast area and people can find all those dates on your socials, right? Yeah. Hell yeah. Is there anything else in the sort of like promo part of a podcast um, besides tour, your Dude Rich cover album and anything else that is important to uh, to promote in the, in the promotion spot? Um, uh, no, not really. Just want to say... Uh, praise Blink-182. Cross the street, naked at night, bent over to show some moonlight. I pulled out some beer and I gulped it down. Nude in a gutter is how I was found. The entire song at the end of the episode. So thank you so much to Colleen for uh, calling in from the road uh, and and letting us play <laughs> hey, I, that I whole her name, song. I thought her name was I thought her name was Colleen, not Call In. Ooh, damn! Um, Great work. Pod. So uh, so yeah, that that song <laughs> in its entirety will be at the end of this episode. So you can hear you know what she does with uh, the sick riff that we were slobbering over. Uh, Josiah, before we get to our guests. Uh, our, our other guests in this unbelievably stacked episodes. What are uh, your final thoughts on the song "Degenerate" by the band Blink One Eighty Two? I think I love it now. Actually, um, it's just like so stupid. The, I think some of the songs that I don't like it's because they're not stupid enough. They're just like pretty stupid. But this one is so stupid that it kind of f- saves itself in its stupidity. Yeah, I kind of feel the same. I, like I think sort of like also like realizing that the word hash is in there really affected my opinion of it. So, <laughs> again, I, I still think this is the worst song on Dude Ranch, but that doesn't make it a bad song. Uh, that's just, that's just... I think the worst, the, to me, the worst song on Dude Ranch is Damn It, to be honest. But uh, we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess but that will come up eventually. Norm- <laughs> I, yeah, this is an insane episode because, so we've had Colleen Green pop in, and now somehow... I don't even know how to how this happened fully, but somehow we have Allie from Peach Kelly Pop and Barry from Joyce Manor at the same time. <laughs> this is a good episode. We're living in uh, a punk America, that's why. <laughs> Welcome to Blink-155. We got, uh, I think this is, like, we, it's not very often we have two guests at once, especially two very exciting guests such as these. We've got Allie from Peach Kelly Pop and Barry from Joyce Manor here at the same time. Welcome. Hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I mean, both of you could have carried an episode on your own, but we're getting this two for one. But there's a good reason for it, which is you have a Blink-182 cover band together. 
Yeah, we do. Um, our first show is in a few days, so we're just getting ready for it right now. How did you end up in a Blink-182 cover band together? I thought you might ask me this question, so I thought about what I would say. <laughs> and the answer is that um, I- I'm pretty active on Twitter, and I I think I was, like, writing stuff about how, like, I can sing really well like Tom, which I've discovered is not as true as I thought it was. But um, I was writing something about that. And then our mutual friend, Rachel R.L. Kelly, um, (laughs) Rachel Levy, she was saying how she can sing really well like Mark. And so her and I decided to start a band. And then we asked our friend Nicole, who's a really awesome drummer. And then Barry ended up joining. I think like Barry was excited about the project and then Rachel without consulting myself or Nicole just asked him to join. <laughs> yeah. so, so you didn't yeah. want, you didn't want Barry in the band. Actually, I was really excited because I was trying to figure out like, um, this is like a whole other thing. Um, obviously the recordings have rhythm and lead parts. And so I was struggling to kind of like figure out which parts to play when, and then Barry plays leads now. So it's so much more fun for me. I don't have to worry about that at all. So I can just like focus on singing and playing rhythm guitar. And he does all kind of like the, the sort of more technical, just technical guitar stuff. So hell yeah. It's like way more fun for me. Um, Is okay. that right? Yeah. Yeah, I was. A, I, I heard about the idea, and like I'm a big fan of Ali's band and uh, Rachel's music, and I was like, holy shit! Like, <laughs> I was just excited to like see them play and like kind of follow them around Grateful Dead style, <laughs> and then um, and uh, yeah, Rachel hits me up out of nowhere, like, yo, do you want to like? be in the band and it was kind of like Jerry Garcia being like do you want to be in the band and I was like yeah totally and now I'm in the band now so it's cool you're like you're like the John Mayer to her Grateful Dead yeah 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 I love that I also say like insane shit in interviews like John Mayer so <laughs> Um, so, I mean, th- there are so many questions. Uh, there's so many directions we can go in. But first of all, I just need to ask each of you, are you a Mark person or a Tom person? Just like at, at the core of your being, if you had to pick. Tom all day. I didn't even have to think about it for one second. Tom. Um, I feel like I'm more like Tom, but I like Mark better. Okay. All right. That's fair. Um, and, and so what songs are you guys covering with – and it's called Blink-183. I don't know if we've said that yet, but... Yeah. Um, I think we can just tell you. It's So, um, it's a very short set list because Rachel, like, went on tour for a month right when we started practicing, and she just got back, like, a couple of days before our show. So, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, I think, yeah, it's uh, What's My Age Again, All the Small Things, First Date, Rock Show... I miss you. And damn it. And damn it. <laughs> oh, wow. So it's a all hits all the time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Well, something that happened with us when we started this podcast is that before we had even released the first episode, Mark found out about it and asked to guest on it. And we were like, there, there's absolutely no way we can have Mark on this early because it'll just like set the, how do we, how do we ever top that? So luckily like a year and a half later, he finally did, but he wanted to be involved from the very beginning. Similarly, I saw he was already tweeting about your cover band and you haven't even played a show yet. Yeah. He's like gentrifying our cover band immediately. (laughs) Back off Mark. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's like just let us have our fun without getting involved and making it all like- okay it's okay this has been a topic a topic of conversation because like I was obviously really excited when he wrote me I thought it was super cool because it's Mark Hoppus and he was like yeah let's play song like he he like said he wanted to play with us or something like that and yeah I just thought it was super cool um, to be acknowledged, but it kind of like, it does change things if we haven't even played a show yet and he's already in there, you know, (laughs) Right. it was like, it's all high pressure now. It's like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like, it was extremely flattering, but it was also like, let us just be dorks kind of, you know? And then, 
like, I don't know how to explain it, but Did it was. Did you have similar feelings with your podcast where you were like, yo, I haven't even, like, worked the kinks out yet and already, like. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, also, like, um, how do I put this nicely? I'm a very critical person, and we've, we haven't been, like, completely fawning over every Blink-182 song because there's so many damn songs. Um, and yeah. so I wanted to, like, if he's there from the very beginning, then then it's like we don't really have space to make fun of him a bunch. But luckily, we've managed to do both. Yeah. Okay, this is, I'm not sure if this should be off the record, so I won't say it yet, but I feel like I, I wanted Barry to be a part of this because I... I just had a hunch that you guys might have similar feelings on some of that, um, where there's like lots of love there, but there's also, I don't know, you want to poke fun at some things or laugh at some things. So just be honest and critical. I'm like, Oh, and, um, yeah, he shouldn't be listening to a podcast about his own band anyway. So <laughs> if he, it's like, Oh, listen to a different podcast. Like what? Like, yeah. Yeah. What I feel like Mark's been also really thirst trapping Joyce Manor lately, especially. Yeah, yeah, dude, it's 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 fine. It's it's not. It's very flattering, but it's also kind of like ah, like I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, are you not like I? I wasn't sure. Like, how did he even find out about this? Is he not really friends with you guys? Or no, I never met him. No, I think he. So <clears throat> I like never expected him to see any interaction that I would put out there towards him, but. I think I like posted about the show and then our, our friends saw it and they were like, cool, I'll go. And then I just jokingly was like, Mark Hoppus, if you want a guest list spot. And then he wrote back the next day and then, and then, so this is like, this show is, it's kind of like a friend's thing. Like it's at someone's house or art space and it's like a, um, like DM for the address. And so after he interacted with me, my, Twitter inbox has like a hundred <laughs> blink one eighty two super fans that are like, what's the address? You know? Like, oh no. <laughs> How do I deal with <laughs> Yeah. So it was it was pretty funny for sure. Can I also say that it's kinda weird that okay, so Joyce Mayer has a song called Heart Tattoo, which is like super obviously extremely like blink 182 worship you know right and it's like the only jo- joyce manor song he likes but it's like isn't that kind of weird <laughs> it's like oh this song that sounds exactly like my band <laughs> is great it's yeah. such a great song. Like, that's, cool. that's like i i get it but yeah. it's like damn dude like i don't know <laughs> i don't know yeah no i mean i don't do don't don't but just like it's just weird to be like i love this thing that is Made in my image. <laughs> yeah. Right. So much. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my that's, god. That's, well, it's also it's, it sounds like a Mark song too, especially. Oh yeah. Because really, I'm. Uh, Do you think there's a Joyce Manor song that sounds like a Tom song? I'm trying to think. Not re- maybe not really. Maybe more in uh, like maybe more lyrically. I like Tom's lyrics that they're kind of like about getting abducted by aliens and. Um, <laughs> They're more cryptic and kind of weirder. Um, uh, so maybe I kind of try to do that and maybe, but uh, I think, I think Tom's melodic sensibility is weirder than Mark's. Like Mark's is more, um, he, he's great, but it's, it's more uh, everyday or ordinary. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why I've always thought that they need each other so badly. And now with Matt Skiba in the band, it's just kind of like, it's just the normie Mark parts without the insane alien guy making it more exciting. So totally. true. So yeah. true. Mm-hmm. So true. What's your guys? And Matt Skiba dresses like so insane now. Like, <laughs> Like witch hat and like has like a Ducati sticker on his guitar. Uh, that sounds cool to me. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, you know, it's funny. We just did a bonus episode this week. Where I got my friend uh, Sexual Jumanji from Twitter to we rated a bunch of fits over the years, and Matt Skiba is definitely the most upsetting. And like, I just feel like when you become a really rich, famous punk guy, you don't know how to spend your money properly. Yeah, Dude, it's insane. Yeah, yeah. Um, so true. I, I almost have like respect for it, but it's it's, it's pretty uh pretty wild. <laughs> So we were, we were joking on tour that like Mark dresses him, like Mark uh, goes and like picks out like the gnarliest, like ugliest shit he can find. And he's like, this is your outfit for tonight. Like uh, some kind of amazing ritual. Right. Yeah. Like he dresses like he's trying to be like 10 subcultures at once. 
Insane, yeah. He's going yeah. super fucking wild. <laughs> and then at least, I mean, at least Travis spends his money on like dead stock black flag shirts or whatever. But then he'll like cut the sleeves all weird. Super low, <laughs> like you can see his like whole ribcage. But he looks good. Like he's like he's he's in good shape. His like face is really tight to his. <laughs> I mean, he, like he looks he looks feral still. It's true. A little bit like haunted behind the eyes because of all like his fucked up hard life and shit, but uh, <laughs> he still looks pretty cool. I think. All he right. Likes, like, he looks doughy. Yeah, <laughs> no, he looks guy. he looks intense and, and and cool. Mark is mostly upsetting me with his really tall hair lately. Dude, that, <laughs> that Jimmy Neutron ass hair is fucking out of control. <laughs> So I want to ask each of you, like, what's your own personal history with Blink-182? And, like, I, I, I can guarantee that at some point you must have been too cool for them. And sort of tell me about that and just sort of your journey through punk with Blink-182 sort of in there as well. Yeah, well, I feel like I should start because my experience is less cool. But I was just telling Barry how, like, when I first heard the band, it was when they were really big on the radio, which is pretty weird for hearing a punk band. You know, that's like... I think one of the only punk bands that I really like where that's how I heard them is like (laughs) listening to the radio in Canada, you know? Um, so I definitely only knew the hits for a long time, but the hits are some of the best songs of all time, you know? So I think, um, I, I became a fan at a young age, probably before I really knew about punk. And I only got to know the cool, less radio friendly stuff as I was older. Um, and yeah, I'd say I'm like a pretty basic kindergarten blink fan. I'm not, I like love them a lot, but I don't know a lot of, you know, like the really cool info or history about them. So that's also why I wanted Barry to be on this episode. Yeah, fair. But I was curious, like then, then from there you sort of, you were part of yeah. the Ottawa garage punk scene and whatnot. And was there a time when you're like, oh, Blink-22, that's gross to me. I'm only into cool things now. Oh, my God. Yeah. When I was in in my early 20s, I was hanging out with a lot of people that were older than me. And I think it was never cool for. Okay, I was born in 87 and maybe these people were born in like the early 80s and they never liked the band. Um, And I think I was like hanging out with these people that that never liked them. And so I I kind of like repressed it even though it was great i was just into other things and now i don't repress anything and i love the band and anything else that isn't cool i don't care so yeah i think yeah. i'm at a i'm at yeah. an interesting age where everyone older than me yeah. hates blink 182 like my older like punk friends hate it and okay. everyone younger than me loves it mm. and i think i'm like right on the on the edge there where it was like up to me to decide and uh, what year were you born 86. Okay. The same, like, same as Allie, pretty much. But, like, um, yeah, I, they, uh, I got um, Dude Ranch for Christmas, and I also got a bunch of Peanut Brittle <laughs> at the same time. And so, like, that record, super, like, hearing it, like, I can, like, I taste can Peanut Brittle for some reason. <laughs> um, that's inside. I know, but I loved it. And then when, like, uh, End of the State came out, and it was huge, I really loved it. And... When it kind of, yeah, like in like my punk circle or whatever, when it became cool to dislike them, I was like double contrarian where I was like, actually, they're dope and the songs are good. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, um, always been down. And even 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 through like the uh, the years where it was not cool to like them, I kind of yeah. prided myself on liking them despite that, which was my Damn. own issue i guess <laughs> uh, I, have. Um, I was not that strong i guess i just yeah just always thought that the songs were just in, like incredible and i love the production like a big jerry finn fan and uh yeah i don't know i was just that that kind of nerd that was like um actually <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that rules. Yeah, I, I was born in 85, and I remember the same sort of thing of being kind of like you choose a path early on. <laughs> but I've always – my musical taste has always been informed by, like, starting off ironically liking things, and then it just becomes, like, real as well. Mm-hmm. That's why I like a lot of, like, really bad, amazing core hardcore because I thought it was funny at first, but now I'm just, like, sincerely into it. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Yeah. yeah. 
that sounds really fun. <laughs> it's a good, amazing core, like like Bane, like or what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I grew up in Vancouver, so like go it alone um, okay. and carry on and all that kind of stuff. Like I just love a good shirt that has a crowd of people on it in high contrast black and white. You know? Hell oh, totally. yeah. Um, uh, I, okay, actually, I wasn't into Blink One Eight Two when they started to get serious. Oh, like boxcar racer vibes or like the untitled record era i didn't like it at the time but now when i revisit it i do like some of that stuff but i for a long time was like i checked out after anima right and uh but i've i've, I've kind of come around on that but yeah it, at the time when like you know uh it was it was one of those things maybe like like i grew up obsessed with afi but i was like not like MTV2 AFI, you know what I mean? Like, right. But now I, I that stuff too. So that's the thing I kind of came around on. Yeah, like I remember thinking I hated Neighborhoods when it first came out, but then through this project going back, I'm like, ah, some of these songs are pretty good actually. I have not visited, revisited that, but I should check that out. Um, that sounds fun. Yeah. So, okay. Dude oh, Ranch. On that one, because sometimes Tom. Like after like they broke up and got back together, he has like this other voice guy. Yeah, I know. know Yeah, there's been an. We need we need to look into that, and we keep talking about doing it, but we can't figure it out. But we're trying to figure. There was like a rumor that he was addicted to painkillers for a while, and we're trying to figure out like maybe maybe we need to talk to a doctor. Like, does that change your voice somehow? Yeah, even on Larry King, it was like, yo, sorry for all that insane shit I said about like saving the world through like angels and airwaves records but <laughs> he's like i was on pain pills because he like, hurt his back or something i don't know yeah but maybe like, he's back on that shit because now he's like literally running an alien research company that i believe is going to save the world yeah. he's definitely going to save the world <laughs> <laughs> i would love that to be true and then you know for yeah the world to be safe. The, the, the thing, him. the thing about Tom that's amazing is that he has openly said before that he's basically trying to write nursery rhymes, and then he says like on crack or whatever, like something really cheesy. <laughs> but, but you know, it's kind of like he has really mastered deceptively simple songwriting. I'm curious if that ever influenced either of you with your own songwriting. Probably, I'd say so. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, trying to write something like uh, just as simple and like, especially like a song like All the Small Things is like super nursery rhyme style, uh, but like pretty genius. I think that's just what I like, you know, and that's probably maybe some of the the first music that sounds like that in the format that I write and play music. So I definitely think it influenced me. Hell yeah. It's, yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, but at the same time, there's just something because you listen to other pop punk songs and it doesn't have the magic that Tom has. Yeah, there's like something um, really nice about him. Like, like musically, it's not that different from like Screeching Weasel or something like that, you know, where it's just like the root note changes, but the lead does the same thing. Yeah. But there's something like we like weird about the way his brain works melodically and lyrically, like. uh like just in all the small things like the like work sucks i know line is like genius and like uh just saying a lot with just like really succinctly and so um true. and uh yeah the, a melody that you just is so simple but just stuck in everyone's fucking head all the time for sure um another question that we're kind of obsessed with thinking about that i don't think can ever be answered but is this idea that like Blink-182 is a punk band, but they try not to say that they're a punk band because that's too loaded. But they also sell merch that says crappy punk rock on it. But they're also, like, the biggest band in the world. I'm just curious, with both of you, have you ever, like, been super concerned about this concept of selling out or what it means to be punk? And kind of where are you at with that idea at this point in time? I grew up in the era where music was free, so that, that idea kind of went out of the window pretty quickly. Um, I feel like I've thought about this a lot. I've kind of been like, uh, bands that exist today have to make a living in whatever way they can, you know? Um, cause like you, you aren't paid for your art that much, you know? So I don't know. I feel like, um, for me, I'd probably say yes to any kind of selling out unless it was like really, um, against my values, you know, which like, I totally 
let a car company use my music. Like, of course, you know. Um, yeah, I'm not really concerned with it, honestly. What about, like, the army? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would love to see an army ad with a Peach Kelly pop song on it. (laughs) That would be really weird. Um, Yeah, I feel like that honestly hasn't been an issue. Like, it's not like I'm like turning down. uh, I'm turning down like car commercial offers, but I'm just saying, like, theoretically, I'm not against whatever people might consider selling out to be. I'd rather not have a nine to five job and keep, keep doing this, you know? So that's kind of one of the only ways for people to do that lately. So, so, so then do you yeah. two, do you think Blink-182 is a punk band in 2019? No, <laughs> no, no, I don't. Think I mean, that. even back in the day, like they were a, a pop punk band, but they were like super into Jimmy world and shit. Like, there's, yeah. like, always been, like, a, it's, like, an emo tinge to it as well yeah. and, like, deceptively indie rock kind of parts. Um, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, the early stuff is kind of, like, more no effects y but they were always, like, so adorable and likable and, like, uh, like a comedy team and yeah. also, like, um, they could be your boyfriend kind of, you know what I mean? Like, they were... Uh, they were the whole package as far as, so it wasn't really about them being a punk band. Like maybe like in the way where they were like, uh, knuckleheads, you know, like nineties yeah. punk was super like practical joke centric. Yeah. And like, like, I feel like, yeah. I feel like uh, a punk band is so many, like to me, a punk band is more about like what's behind the music, you know? Um, like the choices you make and the lifestyle that you live, um, and maybe like personal sacrifices that go into making your music or being able to make music. And so to me, I feel like they're definitely not a punk band, but they write punk style music sometimes and that's it. So I don't know. That's my weird answer. Yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, it's just some, for some reason it's, I feel like it could never be answered. And also then a weird thing keeps happening lately where like you'll see American politicians be like being conservative is the new punk or like Beto O'Rourke will be like, well, I was in a DIY band, so I'm a punk or whatever. It's like everyone wants to claim punk now. That's super annoying. You like one shot of Mars Volta. Like it's cool. Like, don't get fucking Mars Volta. <laughs> yeah, I think punk is. I'll vote for you if you don't get the money. <laughs> yeah, I feel like punk is different to everyone, you know. So that answer or that question could be answered really differently. Yeah, um, I say they're not a punk band. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I think that they would say that too, but then sort of play both sides. Like, they, did you see the newest Blink One Eighty Two video where they have a whole bunch of like Gigi Allen and Fugazi flyers behind them while they play? <laughs> is, it that, is it for that fifty second song? Yeah, yeah. There's like a new video where they and and it's like super tiny printouts of these vintage punk flyers from like every era of punk. <laughs> What is up with when Matt Skiba's voice comes in? It like it's a horrifying. Like it's so <laughs> auto tuned that it's like like, like it's hor- It's like uncanny valley. Like yeah, it's so know. like above the mix too. <laughs> yeah, it's so it mix so loud. What is wrong with that? I don't know, man. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> but like, so we've already, so, but we've kind of established that, like, even though you're fans of Blink 182, you have criticism of them. Like, Mark is still in your world, and like, your bands could easily cross paths with Blink 182. Is that weird? I try not to think about it personally. I don't, I don't like being forced to think about it. Like, uh, I, I okay. feel like with my band, we kind of use Blink-182 as a way to, like, as, like, a lens to look at my own life as opposed to, like, a peer. You know what I mean? Like, oh, man, it's so great to, like, go on tour with our heroes. Like, that would be weird to me because it would, like, shatter this um, repurposing of Blink-182 that I think I've done with my music where um, it makes it, too, like, a little on the nose or something like that. Right. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Or is that nonsense? It totally does. Yeah, yeah. But but I think it's really flattering that the person you're, like, uh, repurposing 
thinks it's cool. It's yeah. kind of like Campbell Soup being like down with Andy Warhol or something, though, where it's like, <laughs> kind of weird. Like, yeah, we should collab. Like, I, I fuck with the vision. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's a little weird. This is different. <laughs> This is different, but kind of the same as what Barry said, but I love Saves the Day a lot. And um, I have purposely not looked up what they look like, like even like when they're younger and currently. And I know like, you know, they're older and they kind of look like older dudes. And I feel like I, I really treasure just being able to focus on their music without knowing anything else about them. And I feel like maybe just being able to control, um, your experience with a band, if it is meaningful to you in that way is really nice. And I don't want to ruin or, or like change the way I look at that band. That means a lot to me kind of, because I know I'm going to listen to the music in a different way. So that's kind of like my own version of that. It, it's different, but kind of the same. And I feel like if I met Mark Hoppus, maybe maybe the way I listened to his band would change. And I don't know if I'd want that necessarily. But right. I don't know. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Um, so this week we yeah. talked. Like, oh, sorry. Go, go, go ahead. ahead. You, what were you going to say? I was just going to say they're like it's like the fucking Brady Bunch or something. Like it's something that exists on TV for me, and like for it to seep into my reality is a, is a little uh, jarring. <laughs> yeah, like, that makes sense. I don't be fucking Brady Bunch, you know what I mean? Like, I want it to be not a real thing. Fictional. Yeah. That's and I, I wonder if Mark's feeling is the exact opposite of that because he just, like, sees these things that are about him and then is like, I want to be a part of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that That is really interesting that someone with that level of success is kind of, like, actively seeking out media that is about him you know um i feel like you know yeah yeah yeah, like i feel like lots of like quote unquote like famous people aren't interested in knowing kind of or like but like he is clearly like it he's actively seeking it out which is like it's not i'm not saying that to like poke fun or be mean like Maybe I would do the same thing, you know. In but fairness, like you did tweet at him. I did tweet at him, which I forgot about. So like, it probably popped up in his feed. You I know? think he's just maybe being a good sport. But like, yeah, maybe yeah. he's just being supportive, and he's like, "Fuck this band," but I'll be nice to them. <laughs> so maybe I'm totally wrong. You or, know? or the or the pessimistic read is that he's trying to get in on the ground floor of all the things about him, so that he can control the narrative. Own the joke, yeah. yeah maybe. Like, the joke can't be on me if I'm like yeah. on board or something. Like that. Like, <laughs> maybe he feels bullied or something. Yeah, there's like there's a lot of ways it could go, and I guess it's like silly of me to think that he's not just being supportive. I don't know, but but it is interesting to uh, think about it. It's it's funny. <laughs> it's so weird. Um, okay, so this week we talked about the song "Degenerate" from Dude Ranch. Other than uh, uh, having a taste of peanut brittle come into your mouth, Do you have any thoughts on this song i haven't heard it in a i should have fucking listened to it before i came on the show i didn't realize i was going to be a guest i thought i was going to be a backup <laughs> guest but <laughs> like annoyingly dominating the conversation no i'm honestly glad i was like oh no i feel like I, i'm going to be a bad guest because i'm not a super super fan but i know barry is so thanks for dominating the conversation this this one is like a jokey song it's like yeah Kicked old Sally because she's fat and stuff like that. He says like stuff like that. I remember laughing at that as a kid. Uh, yeah, it, it seems like it was written like maybe even before the Cheshire Cat era and like brought back as like a joke song for the record or something. Um, yeah, I don't know. Doesn't don't like Green Day have a song kind of like this too on on one of their albums where it's like I don't know. The verses are like this. Uh, are kind of similar. I don't know. Yeah, I could see that. We've been doing a bunch of uh, Blink-182 joke songs in a row lately, and our, our listeners fucking hate when we do that because the joke songs are so bad. Yeah, they're yeah. bad. I, I never I never really loved this one. Yeah. Um, I don't think I had ever heard it. I was probably when I listened to the albums, I'd like skip past it, honestly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I did think it was kind of cool when I listened to it before the show. It's very of its time. Like every, every like pop punk band from that time had to have like 
joke songs, like yeah. no effects. Like yeah. I think they have like eighty percent joke songs, <laughs> and, like, like five or six good actual good songs. Yeah. Um, so true. And then and, yeah, like uh, uh, it was it was just it was the style at the time. Yeah. So have either of you written songs that you would consider joke songs? All of them. No. <laughs> uh, I personally have not. Uh, maybe my whole first album is uh, like an unintentional joke, <laughs> but no. <laughs> I think it's. I think that you both have songs that are funny, but they're not like joke songs. They just have sort of like a sense of irony to them a little bit or something. Like self self deprecating kind yeah. of. See, I think Blink One Eighty Two do that, and they do that really well. Where it's like a, it's like a joke song, but not like full, like fully. Now we're goofing around. You know what I mean? Like a skit almost. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, Dude Ranch literally like has like skits on it. <laughs> yeah. About horse fucking. <laughs> the skits are so bad, and yet I still, for me, Dude Ranch is still the best one. I think. I do like Dude Ranch a lot. Yeah. Um. Oh, okay. Shit. Okay, so, so I think I think uh, I, I mean I could keep going forever. This has been really fun, but um, let's just let's just wrap it up with if you guys want to plug anything. I mean, obviously the huge show coming up this weekend. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I feel like we shouldn't plug it because <laughs> I didn't realize it was like someone's house. <laughs> so don't come to the show. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I don't know. Both of us are working on new music right now, so. Uh, I'm going on tour in August just on the West Coast. So if you live in any major city on the West Coast, we'll be there if you want to come see us. Uh, that's all I have to say. <laughs> I just want to apologize for being mean the whole time and <laughs> just say I love Blue Man 2 and I yeah. love Mark Hoppus. Yeah. And I think it's really nice that yeah. he's always so supportive of uh, my stupid band. And I'm um, sorry that I'm an ingrate. <laughs> yeah, I also feel like, um, yeah, I, I guess I'll just copy Barry and say, like, uh, I'm a huge fan, and I was super excited that he took an interest in our our cover band. You know, I like I was talking shit a little bit, but it's so cool, and uh, it made me really happy. So there you go. It just makes me feel a lot of stuff, and there's a lot to examine there. Yeah, and, and if it goes negative sometimes and also Pressure. much love and respect to Matt Skiba I'm sorry for making fun of <laughs> just learn how to dress at least I mean I look like shit compared to him like that but like <laughs> no. you know he's dating Asia Argento or yeah. Argenta I forget yeah you know the oh. like Italian actress are they actually uh, dating yeah. or are they just kind of I mean it's hard it's hard to follow his Instagram that's for sure Maybe a, about a month ago, I looked up Matt Siva's Instagram and I just looked and they're like, you know, doing kissy faces on each other's Instagram. So I was like, probably they're dating, but right. yeah. just uh, like loving on each other publicly. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's going to take a lot more than just a podcast to figure out Matt Skiba, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah. Cool. A research team, maybe like Tom's Tom's alien agency can try to yeah. take a step. <laughs>
Have my nuts and take my rats Take a nude, wore a thong for a hobby and make fun